Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting in five minutes' time. Please do come into the auditorium. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, all you beautiful people. Go ahead and find your seats. Welcome to day two of Missional AI 2024. You survived one day. Um, it, it almost looks like we didn't lose too many people after the first day. So congrats on surviving and coming back for, for the second day. Really excited to, uh, to, to have you back. Hopefully you had a good evening. Um, I don't know if any of you went out to, to uh, Disney uh, places or um, actually good restaurants, um, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you found something good. Um, so I want to also welcome our, uh, again, our virtual participants online. Thank you for joining. And uh, also uh, another big thanks to our uh, sign language interpreters and, and the deaf community um, and hard of hearing community joining. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so just uh, a couple of reminders here as we, uh, as we start. Um, so keep uploading your questions to, to Slido. Um, as, as you can tell, I tried to synthesize some of those questions together for our panelists somewhat uh, successfully, maybe not completely successfully. Um, if you didn't get your question answered yesterday, hey, guess what? All of our presenters are here. You can just like walk up to them and also ask them a question. So I'd encourage you to do that as well. Um, hey, you know, all of us have Wi-Fi issues every day of our life, um, including yesterday. Um, so we've got a little bit of uh, info on the Wi-Fi network. There's more than one network. I think they're going to put this up on the screen here. Um, so today, there's going to be a, a, a slight uh, difference in the networks that you can join. I don't know if you have that Wi-Fi network information. Some of you have already cracked into the other Wi-Fi networks. The password's probably like admin123 or the same name as the, the Wi-Fi network. Um, so we'll get that up here in a second. OK, there you go, Wi-Fi details. There you go. We got our own Wi-Fi network, a uh, really secure password that no one could guess. Um, all right, uh, reminder, keep your phones on, on silent. Um, you all did great at that yesterday. Really, really proud of you. Uh, also, a reminder, there's, there's also people walking around with the red dots on their name tag. That's a reminder. They don't want their photo um, taken here either for personal preference or for security reasons. So if you're going to take photos on your phone, just a reminder again, I think the best thing is just like don't take them in this area, kind of move out, take some photos by the, by the pond with your friends and that sort of thing um, in, a, in a private environment. Uh, the slides are being uploaded to the, to the app as well, so um, you, you might have seen some of those already going, so don't feel like you have to get that photo um, of the slide that you want. We'll have our usual coffee and lunch breaks, um, same as yesterday. And, um, and yeah, we've got a lot of amazing things in store today. Uh, I, I was happy to see uh, my, my friend James, I don't know where he's at, he's mic'd up. He also has some sort of... Uh, device in his glasses. There you go. Yeah, he's he's like he's cyborg now. I think. Um, so <laughs> he's he's great. He he promised to tell better jokes than I than I did, which I don't know if that's possible actually. Um, but we'll see if that if that comes through. And um, I also see my friend Rue over there, who um, is is amazing. I can't wait to to hear from her. I was thinking this morning as um, so my reading this morning. I'm behind in my Bible plan. I'll admit that to you all. Um, but I'm, I'm not giving up. Uh, and this morning was in uh, John 14. I was reminded, so my granddad, who, uh, who passed away like six years ago, I would always call him. Um, and I was reminded, in particular in reading this, what technology was able to do for him in terms of Bible engagement. So he lost his, his vision in his old age. Uh, macular degeneration, and he kind of went through phases. It was like first, uh, like he got the, like the super large print Bible, right? And then he got like this uh, device that you could put the Bible under and it would like magnify it. It was like there's three, three words on the screen and he was able to read that, but he just, he was so persistent. Um, and, and he would always, in the, 
in my phone conversations with him, say, Daniel, uh, what's your favorite gospel? What, what's your favorite gospel? And, and he said, mine, mine is the gospel from, from St. John. And then he would, he would just recite all of John 14 to me. Um, and every time, like, he, he was so persistent in his Bible engagement, he didn't, he didn't sort of give that up when um, he wasn't able to read a normal Bible. And I think of how much we can do now with audio, with, uh, with digital Bibles, um, with what we talked about yesterday. And so I'd encourage you, um, that's going to be on my mind today. Um, think about, as Stu mentioned yesterday, those, um, those opportunities that uh, we haven't been able to say yes to yet, but that the, the, this AI technology gives us the, the ability to say yes to. Um, so it's, it's my privilege uh, to, to welcome to the stage a member of, um, of a community that I think is also well represented here, which is the, the bald community. Um, uh, and that, that is my friend, Dal Anderson, who is, is uh, with Mission Mutual and, and um, just uh, playing an, a huge role in, in multiple areas in Bible translation as part of the E10 Innovation Lab and E10 in general. Um, and uh, he's had a great perspective on bringing advanced technology and innovation and new thinking to that space. So please welcome Dal Anderson. Hey, thanks, uh, Daniel. I uh, appreciate joke tellers. I look forward to you starting telling some at some point. <laughs> it is a, a privilege uh, to be with you this morning, and it's, it's uh, my opportunity to share a few devotional thoughts this morning. And as Daniel said, my name is Dal Anderson, and uh, some of you uh, know me better than others. It's it's awfully good to look out into a crowd like this and see uh, friendly faces. Uh, I'll admit uh, some of you look less friendly uh, than others, but I'm looking forward to meeting those of you even who may not look as friendly uh, as others this morning. But I'm trusting that we're all friendly in the room. That's 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 how you want to feel when you're up here. Everybody is friendly, so I'm trusting that. Uh, what you may not know about me is I have four children. I have seven grandchildren. Now, one of those uh, grandchildren, the seventh, I haven't met yet, but he's coming. I'm going to meet him in the next maybe five or six weeks. Uh, like you, perhaps, those of you who have children, maybe those of you who have grandchildren, my own spiritual development, uh, God has used my children to influence my spiritual development because I'm, I'm able to look at what he's doing through the lens of how he's working in my children or the mistakes they're making or the messes that they get into or the trouble that they bring me. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about this morning through uh, the lens of scripture uh, is about risk taking and we're going to talk about faithful risk taking and the role that faith has in taking risk. But before we do that, I thought I'd share a bit of a story, start a story about one of my children that has to do with risk taking. And I might bounce back and forth to that story through the remainder of some of my comments. Now, I have four kids, as I mentioned, two, two girls, two boys. They're all adults, mostly. Um, <coughs> the older two are girls, the younger two are boys. My oldest son was a baseball player played baseball his whole life uh, from about 5 to 18. And if you play baseball in Texas, which is where we're from, uh, you, you have to deal with heat. Baseball is a summertime sport. It's hot in Texas, 110, 115 degrees. So this story of risk-taking with my son uh, begins at, a, at about age 7 or 8. It's about 20 years ago. We've been in a tournament, long, hot tournament, these tournaments in Texas, you're, you're hot, you're sweaty, you get thirsty, and you, you need to hydrate. Now, that might be Gatorade, it might be water, perhaps if you're less concerned about hydration, it might be a soft drink. If you're my son, and you're even less concerned than that about hydration, it might be milk. Often, milk was his go-to uh, 
uh, hydrating mechanism. So we get in the car after this long tournament. He's hot, we're sweaty, we're tired. And he finds in the back seat, in the cup holder, a bottle of chocolate milk. Now it's 110 degrees, it's been there for two weeks. <laughs> it's a half-filled bottle of chocolate milk that's been sitting there for two weeks. My son decides it's time to consider some risk. Now I'm going to come back to that story in just a minute. I want to suggest to you that as we start thinking about risk taking together today and, and specifically faithful risk taking, that it's a balancing act. Uh, you, you may be able to find yourself somewhere on uh, this scale or this continuum. We all tend to measure risk across either the lens of avoiding it or perhaps taking it. And I would suggest to you that we we have some sort of DNA default mechanism inside of us where we as individuals tend to either press a little bit down on the right or a little bit down on the left. And I would suggest to you in the back seat of the car that day, my son was pressing left. He, he, was, he was beginning to consider pressing left as opposed to right. But I think we all measure risk somewhere on this continuum. In addition to measuring risk, we all tend to do some analysis. Could be light, could be significant. <coughs> it's, it's possible that there are more than four outcomes when we do risk analysis, but at the risk of being less than comprehensive, I have four up here. Maybe you can find your, your normal position across one of these four. When we analyze risk, we're either looking at the end of the day to reduce it. Hey, I don't, I don't mind the topic that we're talking about, but the risk that's being suggested is way too much. If, if we could reduce the risk, I might be in. My favorite, personally, up here is the transfer. Hey, I'm on board with this idea so long as somebody else does it. If somebody else can digest the risk and somehow I can benefit from the outcome, well, count me in on that. I'm going to pray for the risk taker. I'm going to encourage the risk taker. But do not put me in the risk taking seat. And then sometimes we analyze it and we accept it. I want to suggest to you that in the back seat of the car that day, my son did no analysis. And he was full on in this particular moment headed to acceptance. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. I promise this worked when I was practicing earlier. So we've talked about measuring risk, balancing act analyzing risk, all this leads to behavior. I'm going to suggest to you that our default is far too often to just simply dodge it. We're, we're just looking to get away from it if we can. And we're dodging it perhaps because we're looking to protect ourselves. We're dodging it perhaps because we have some fear of loss. The loss is too great. I can't quite talk myself into this. I think in ministry, I want to suggest to you that, that a little too often, we, t we tend to apply stewardship as an excuse to risk-taking. I'm a better steward of God's resources than that. I'm not going to take this risk. And in the name of stewardship, we reduce it, we transfer it to somebody else, or we just avoid it. I want to suggest to you that that may be a lack of faith. In our ministries, I'm not even sure that we consider faith to be a currency to apply to risk taking. I want to suggest to you that that's the only currency, at least the primary currency, that we should apply. 
to risk taking. So we're going to spend some time in God's word looking at what faithful risk taking looks like. We're going to do that in the book of Matthew. We're going to spend most of our time talking about uh, the parable of the talents, talking about the servants in chapter 25, and then we'll, we'll bounce really quickly back to chapter 8 and look at uh, the leper and the centurion. Each of these are going to be examples of risk-taking that were informed by faith. I'm going to read from God's Word. Matthew 25, I'm going to start, I know the slide says verse 14, I'm going to pick up at verse 15, and I'm going to read through about verse 28 or 29. You can pull your favorite version of of God's Word onto your digital device, or maybe uh, open your scriptures in front of you and read along. (coughs) Matthew chapter 25, verse 15 through 29. He gave five bags of silver to one two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account how they had used the money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done. Good job. Here's more. Let's celebrate. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags. Here's two more. The master said, well done. Here's even more. Let's celebrate. The servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you. I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I'd lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew me, if you knew me, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant, gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in a bank? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the other one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now, what, what was at risk? We, we could all come up with our list of things that were at risk in this particular story. At least the money was at risk. I would suggest to you that we f- we daily, at least if not weekly, then perhaps monthly face opportunities to consider faithful risk where the thing at risk at least is the money, the silver in this case. Perhaps there are things less directly in play. Maybe we're concerned about our standing. We we just can't quite put ourselves in a position to risk our standing. These servants had standing with the master. They didn't want to blow that. None of the three of them, all three would have been considering standing. I think credibility in this case was a big one because the scriptures tell us that the master allocated the talents according to their abilities. Who wants to, for someone who thinks so well of their ability to risk the credibility that comes along with with someone saying you are so able you are so capable oftentimes we don't want to put that at risk our credibility is too important 
Maybe it's our reputation. Word's going to get around about this risk that I took, particularly if it didn't go well. I think it's interesting that the one who had the most to lose went for it. And the one who had the least to lose hid the idea. I'm going to suggest to you that our behavior, most of us anyway, is opposite. We have the most to lose. God has given us the most. But we tend to clutch it and not risk it. <clears throat> in this case, the story we're reading in scriptures, the other way around. What did the players say? <clears throat> look, Master, look what faith has rendered. The Master said, <clears throat> if you knew me, why didn't you? This one's painful to me. If you knew me, why didn't you? I think we should all feel challenged by that. If we reflected backwards in Matthew, back into chapter 8, we'd see the story of the leper who had faith enough to touch Jesus because he knew he would be healed. We look at the centurion whose servant was in need of healing, but the centurion had faith to approach Jesus, and in both cases, Jesus satisfied. In response to their faith, they took a risk that was preceded by faith. Jesus told the centurion, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Because you believed, it has happened. Oh, my goodness. So let's recap. I want to suggest to you that God's response was to faith, not the risk. This is a conversation, yes, about risk-taking, but it's a conversation about faithful risk-taking. God's response in these cases was not to the risk. It was to the faith. The risk was taken as an outpouring of that faith. Again, Jesus said, if you knew me, why didn't you? Why didn't you have faith and take the risk? And Jesus said, because of your faith, I have done it. I have healed you. I have healed your friend. As we conclude our reflections this morning, I've left you hanging uh, with the story. So, this morning we've talked about faithful risk-taking. I would suggest to you, I don't know if your children are like this, but mine tend to take blind risk or uninformed risk or maybe just downright stupid risk. That's an introduction to my kids, at least when they were younger. So if we find ourselves in the back seat, my sons grabbed this 150, 160-degree bottle of half drank milk that's been sitting there for two weeks. He's measured the risk, pushed his thumb down on the risk side as opposed to the avoidance side. He's done no analysis to consider transferring it or avoiding it. He's just decided to full on take it in a blind, uninformed, maybe even perhaps stupid sort of way. So in that moment, he decides to go for it and he opens that bottle and there's an explosion like I've not personally heard before. Maybe it just sounded louder because of the other things that went along with it. The explosion moved about half of the remaining liquid up to the windshield. And the rest of the liquid went up onto the ceiling. And then as I looked back at him, it was dripping down off of his ears and off of his nose and into his lap. Curdled chocolate milk. That was two weeks old. So we have to pull off the road. I have to strip him naked. <laughs> We're standing in a gas station on a main thoroughfare in the city in which we live. He's naked. I'm taking his clothes off, throwing them in the truck. We get home, take a shower. Here's the 
takeaway for today. We want to suggest faithful risk-taking. If, if you end up doing the uninformed, blind, uh, stupid risk-taking, you could end up naked at a gas station. <laughs> Are we taking risk without faith? Are we avoiding risk because of limited faith? And is my relationship with Christ intimate enough to know him and trust him as, as their servant did in taking their risk? God's faithful to respond to our faith, not the risk taking. But are we faithful enough to take the risk? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your direction, which is so clear in your scriptures. We pray today that we would be faithful first and that the outpouring of that faith would be a willingness and a readiness to take risks. Father, I pray that we would be uh, good stewards of the things to which you've entrusted us and that we would allow that good stewardship to include the currency of faith. So, Father, we lean into you this morning. We are thankful for the thing that you've called us to, this work that we share. We pray that our time together would honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's my privilege to uh, introduce, I've not met James, but I understand from Daniel that James is a cyborg joke teller. So, James Poulter, uh, you're up. Pri uh, privilege to introduce you. Good morning. That means you can hear me, so that's a good sign. Watching a American Sign Language uh, professional describe the explosion of a bottle of chocolate milk is a sight to behold, isn't it? It is a sight to behold. You know, I have a couple of other stories that are a bit like that. About 30 seconds into this journey, I was pretty convinced that something terrible had gone wrong. We were on a boat at the side of the river Seine in Paris. I had gone out to visit a uh, client who had somewhat flipped the client-agency relationship dynamic on me. They had actually looked after us for once. It was really nice. Uh, I was the agency in this scenario. And I had gone out to visit this client in Paris. They were a large oil consulting company. I was at the start of my career. It was my first international business trip. And the client in question was a small French man, uh, Eric's here later, it wasn't him, don't worry, but a, a small French chap who called Francois, his actual name. And the only way to describe him was a cross between a kind of French bulldog and a kind of rugby prop forward, if you know what that is, or like a linebacker. Um, he was about five foot four and had an accent as thick um, as, you know, kind of a, a wedge of cheese. He was, he was a, quite a guy. And he invited us out on his boat that evening uh, on the Seine, a uh, little pleasure cruiser. And we went down and got on board this boat. And we were greeted by picnic boxes. These were beautiful picnic boxes. They were about you know, kind of the size of a, a piece of paper, purple, thick. They had real silverware in them and little salt and pepper shakers like you get on the airplane, and, which I did steal. And it, it, was a lovely, um, it was a lovely experience. It was also followed by about 12 bottles of Chateau Petrus behind us as well, which kind of made the experience Interesting. And um, we were on this boat, and Francois looks around at us, and he says, okay, I think we're ready to go. And I said, okay, that sounds good. And so Francois turns to the deck hands, and they unlash the boat down the side. And he grabs the handle, and he throws it down, and off we cruise into the River Seine, the lights of the Eiffel Tower lighting our you know, starry night. And it was about 30 seconds into that journey that I knew something was terribly wrong because the sound of metal ripping, followed by the cracking of wood splintering, and then the splashing next to us was what accompanied me as I looked to my left and saw the poles around the outside of the boat next to us being ripped from the deck and splashing into the water behind the boat. Yeah, that's how I reacted. <laughs> and so I looked at this thing, and I looked at Francois, and he looked at us, 
And there was another small French man that emerged from the boat next to us. And what appeared to have happened is that the deckhands had unlashed us from the mooring that we were attached to. But they hadn't unlashed us from the boat next to us. And so we were ripping the deck apart of the boat as we, we cruised away. And Francois, well, he, looked at, he looked at us and he looked at the French guy next to us who was screaming something in a language I cannot neither pronounce nor uh, repeat. And all he said was, do not worry, we will deal with it tomorrow. And he put the hammer down on that boat and we cruised into the night. <laughs> and I have no idea what happened to that boat ever again, but we will deal with it tomorrow. Sorry, Eric, if you're in the room, by the way, that accent was probably going to get me cancelled. For those of you watching online, please don't tweet that. But um, we will deal with it tomorrow. This, my friends, I feel like is one of the, the big things that arises when we think about this industry that we're spending a lot of time thinking about, this artificial intelligence industry. Because whilst we're plowing into experimentation, while we're taking on new opportunities, while we're constantly flabbergasted, is there a word for that in... Let's see. Yeah, flabbergasted in, uh, in, the world of <laughs> in the world of AI, constantly. We also, I think, have a tendency to kind of say, well, there might be some issues over here we need to deal with, but maybe we'll deal with them tomorrow. Let's just keep going. And my challenge to you this morning is that if we want to put the foot on the accelerator pedal into this world of translation, into the world of producing uh, new experiences that further the gospel and that bring people to know Christ through artificial intelligence. We need the foot on the accelerator, but you would never get in a car with an accelerator pedal that didn't have a brake. And so we have to understand that if we don't put good brakes into these experiences, then we should never be pushing on that accelerator. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning as we get started is this idea around AI risks and ethics and understand a little bit more about how we can have a bit of a framework to think about these things as we go forward. Is that okay? Okay. For those of you listening online, I'm very sorry if I'm going at a pace you can't keep up with, but I have been doing this for a long time and I've never got any slower, so I apologize to you now. Okay. Uh, a quick disclosure statement. Some of the content in this presentation was produced using AI. Here is a full statement. It gives you all of the information you will need. You'll not be able to read it. Bye. Okay. Um, it's important, I think, that transparency is a place that we start from, hey? I want you to think for a moment. What's the best dinner party that you've ever been to? Maybe for those of you in the room, just close your eyes for a couple of seconds. Hopefully the caffeine doesn't, you know, kind of keep us from falling asleep. What's the best dinner party you ever went to? Hopefully it was some nice food, right? That's a prerequisite for a dinner party. Otherwise, it's not a good one. Maybe you showed up on time. Hopefully you showed up on time. Hopefully your host was glad to see you. And hopefully that they you know, kind of entertained you. There were some other people to talk to. It was a nice experience. You may be left with a gift, and you left on time being welcomed back again at some point in the future. The dinner parties, they have some rules about them, don't they? You can open your eyes, by the way, if you, if you, unless you've nodded off. Um, what are the two things that you never speak about, though, at a dinner party? Politics and... Okay, let me tell you about a dinner party. I went to this dinner party <laughs> at the, um, it, it, it's a place in the UK, if you hadn't noticed, my accent might give it away that I'm not from these parts, um, in the UK called the Royal Agricultural College. Uh, the Royal Agricultural College is a place in, uh, in rural England in Sirencester. Anyone been there? No, good. And um, the Royal Agricultural College is famous for a couple of things. One, it has a massive monument to Thomas Cranmer. Anyone know who Cranmer is? Yeah, okay, good. The, the scholars in the room know Cranmer and the, the Book of Common Prayer. And I was at the Book of Common Prayer Society's annual general meeting, and I had dinner with a, a bunch of people. And I sat down at this, this dinner party, and I was sat across uh, from a chap called Stanley Johnson. Stanley Johnson is the father of Boris Johnson, um, you may be familiar with him. <laughs> He's been in the news. And um, Boris Johnson, and I was sat next to the Bishop of Rochester on my right. Guess what we spoke about? <laughs> you see, when we talk to AIs, when we have AIs join the conversation, I think it's super important that we're able to make sure that they stay on topic, right? And that they also don't stray into areas that we wouldn't have them be involved in. The thing is that we have this alien 
experience going on right now, don't we? They're coming to live with us. I mean, if I had told you a few years ago that there were aliens coming from another planet, that they were definitely coming, like we knew they were on their way, we had critical evidence that they were on their way, and, but they're coming on from 30 years from now, the time horizon wouldn't matter to us, would it? All that would matter is that we knew that they were coming. Now, let's take aside the point that like a few months ago, people like testified in Congress that they're already here, and we all wake up every morning not concerned about that. Just leave that there for the moment. <laughs> But we would prepare every single day like they're coming. And I think that one of the things that we've taken somewhat for granted in the church is that we see opportunities on the horizon and we're running after them. But we haven't taken into account that these AIs are learning from us in the same way that an alien observing Earth at a distance is learning from us. And we have this opportunity now to engage with these technologies, to imbue them with all of the knowledge of human existence. But we also need to put the, the guardrails around them to keep them on topic, to keep them in the conversation. So... How do we prepare for the aliens are coming? It feels like we've kind of hit this peak AI everywhere all at once kind of moment, doesn't it? You know, this isn't just in these rooms where we're in expertise, you know, kind of talking about this topic. This is subsumed into all of our you know, experience every day in life, in media, in culture, in our education systems. It's, it's everywhere. And it's happened so quickly. And we've seen this in previous media revolutions as well, that when suddenly there's a massive explosion of things, the church has a couple of different ways of reacting to it. Often, it's either keep it at bay, we look at, you know, looking for 666 in the code, making sure it's not there, you know, like it's, uh, we keep that safe, or that we're slow to adopt things and then are slightly regretful that we didn't get there quicker. And sometimes it's both. <laughs> and I want to you know, say to us that despite the, you know, this, this acceleration, this explosion of things like ChatGPT uh, you know, in the past couple of years, I mean, this is the fastest consumer explosion of technology that we've ever experienced, right? Is that when these things happen to us, it can be very easy for us to go one of two ways. Either go, isn't this amazing, dive in full force, or try and pull up the drawbridge and say, we're going to keep this out of these, these areas of the church. And my opportunity, I think, for us is to say we can go after the accelerator pedal, but we also have to have really good brakes when we go and use it so that we can pull back. Because we've seen in past media revolutions, haven't we, with what's happened in social media in particular in the past decade, that there can often be secondary and tertiary consequences that we don't foresee when these things first emerge, and we want to be protecting against them. So let's think a little bit about what those, those issues might look like. Well, AI is everywhere all at once, and because we're often thinking about it in lots of different contexts, it's important to see how quickly it's penetrating into different areas of our experience. This is no longer like a, a platform that we had when social media emerged. I do a lot of work with large global companies uh, here in the US and in Europe, and one of the things that they are constantly asking is like, whose job is it to do AI in our companies? Are you experiencing that? Whose job is it? When social media emerged, we hired a social media person, and it became their job. Even you go further back, when the web emerged, we hired a web person, and it was their job. But whose job is AI when it's in all of the things that we already have and use every day? AI ethics, in particular, isn't just one person's job. It's all of our jobs. And I think we need to get our organizations, the people that we interact with, and our partners understanding that this isn't something that they can just put a chief AI officer in and that will deal with the problem, or even an ethics officer and deal with the problem. We have to make this a problem that everyone is accountable for, because this affects everyone. At Vixen Labs, the company that I run, we run an annual survey called the AI Consumer Index, looking at the adoption of AI by the general public in the US, the UK, Mexico, Germany, and Australia. And from our data this year, we know that over 50% of adults in the US have already used some form of generative AI tool, and nearly 67% of, uh, of uh, adults in the UK are already using chatbots of some description multiple times a week. And unlike previous media revolutions, this doesn't contain itself within you know, the next generation, you know, the alphas or the Zs or the Ys or the elder millennials as myself. Like, uh, it doesn't, doesn't contain itself in these generations. It cuts across all age brackets and demographics. And so when something has been adopted that quickly, we have to realize that this is something that affects all of us equally. We might be in our individual projects here in this context thinking about translation work or mission work and thinking about it in a very specific application.
But this technology has reached far greater consumer adoption than anything that we've ever seen before, far faster, and way quicker than we've been able to keep up with both regulation and also with uh, you know, kind of guidance and guidelines. And it's going to continue to accelerate into new form factors that we couldn't possibly have foreseen before from things like physical AI devices, like the Rewind Pendant, or you might have seen in uh, examples of the AI Humane Pin, uh, if people nodding, have you seen this? The, the Humane Pin and like the Rabbit R1 gadget that's just been released, mine might some might show up <laughs> in weeks to come. And these new types of devices are gonna go living with us in our everyday experience, right? It's nice ideas, even exemplified today, you know, we, we have, you've all got stickers on your lanyards, right? Daniel mentioned it before about photos. Okay, I mean, if I walked up here and just took a photo of this room, do I need your permission? You're in a public space. Technically, no. We've got some agreed social norms here, but what about when I'm walking around wearing one of these at all times, filming constantly? Will we come to accept these things? How many of you um, in the early days had one of the, uh, how many of you were Bluetooth guy? There's a lot of men in this room. Yeah, Bluetooth guy, well done. So you had the little thing. Yeah, like this microphone, little blue kind of ear. That was a look for a while, kind of early 2000s. Went really well with your BlackBerry curve. Um, yeah, you went, um, <laughs> yeah. That never really kind of reached like peak social acceptance, did it? <laughs> BlackBerry, BlackBerry guy with the, with the blueberry mic. And um, I, I think we've seen though that these devices can reach social acceptance very quickly, far quicker than we might accept. How many of you have got a pair of AirPods in your pocket? and wear them constantly, right? If you took AirPods as a device category out of Apple and listed it on the stock market, it would be bigger than NVIDIA and Adobe combined. Well, before NVIDIA started selling GPUs. Um, <laughs> but it's huge, right? And I don't think necessarily that this is the device that's gonna come next for us, but these devices raise really interesting ethical questions around what are the boundaries that we have chosen to put up in society and how will we maintain them when AI is no longer a thing that's contained in an intentional device that you have to retrieve from your pocket and place in front of someone, but is ambiently in front of us at all times. You know, we're being afflicted by what Keen says here in this new disease, um, that technological unemployment may become something that is, we all have to live with. He wrote this in 1930. <laughs> <laughs> you know, technological unemployment. AI ethics isn't just an issue of technology, but it's also an issue of humanity. I'll say that again for emphasis, and so he, ha he gets that. AI ethics isn't an issue of technology, it's an issue of humanity. If I come into your organization tomorrow and say, hey, I've found a way of us reducing your expenditure in your call center by 30%, you're, if you're a shareholder-driven organization, you know, the CEO or the CFO is going to say, great, let's do that. What do we do with the 30% of people that we just lost from that organization? The technology doesn't need to be questioned necessarily, but the humanity does. These are the types of issues that are presenting us uh, with some really difficult questions that we've not had to face before. But I think they can be centrally summed up in this. The robots, they're coming to help, great. Or the robots are coming. Help, <laughs> like, which is it? This seems to be the challenge of the day. This is the thing that we are faced with as we bring AI into our ministries, into our companies, into our schools, um, and into our you know, everyday family experiences, is that are they really coming to help, or are we gonna need to help them help us? So, I wanna put to you guys that this is our Gutenberg moment. None of us sit around questioning every day that you know, the news or the book that you don't like exists today because Gutenberg invented the printing press. <laughs> we don't say that there is some ethical issue with the printing press. It enabled amazing things, but its original intention was the spreading of the gospel. We see this technology that we have now in our hands today as the, gives us the ability to spread the gospel. But will we question whether or not it will also spread fake news, or things that we don't like, the world might agree with. So this is our moment, and we only get one shot at this, I think, that to you know, go after these opportunities, because we won't get to put these things back in the box. And I think it's in rooms like these and in conferences like this where we will get to set these standards, and so I hope that we'll take it seriously. 
We've seen throughout the history of AI, all the way back as far as Turing with his test for good or for bad, that the you know, different um, emergent experiences have, have arisen through the development of the AI that we have today. And at each one of these different stages throughout this history, the church has had opportunities to try and respond to the use of technology, not just in the AI landscape, but throughout all of history. You know, when we first saw, you know, we worked back through the emergence of things like the uh, Bible app. We worked back through things like online church. I mean, remember when, you, you know, five years ago, we had people saying, oh, no, we can't do online church. It breaks down relationships. And then COVID comes in and changes our opinions on these things. The church has had to learn to respond to technology throughout the history of all different revolutions. We can't put it back in the box. But what we can ask is, what are we going to do about it? So, will we embrace AI with a kind of awkward Christian side hug, um, or <coughs> um, will we kind of go full frontal? Yeah, I'm going to stick by that. Um, <laughs> when the technology moves, the church responds, they say. We've seen throughout this experience that often, as I said, we respond either too late or we push back too heavily. You know, go back as far as the 1440s, Gutenberg you know, produces um, things with the Bible. Um, radio broadcasts begin to take, help us take uh, the, the gospel across the airwaves. And then we see the televangelist movement of emerging with television all the way right through till now. But every one of these different stages, we've seen the good and the bad emerge at the same time. And I want us to think about as we move into this next phase of technological development within the church that we bring to it our own ethical framework, that we establish an agreed set of guidelines and a way in which that we will do this together. The important thing to say is that AI ethics isn't something that the church isn't already thinking about. Uh, for those of you, this will be too small at the back, but this comes from the Glue AI and the Church survey. People might have read some of that work that's come out, um, some great work done by um, our colleague uh, Steele, who's, who's here, and the, and the broader team at Glue. And we found that there are many church leaders who are admitting to feeling uncomfortable and anxious about AI coming into their churches. They say that they should resist or condemn it, you know, a quarter at this point. Um, but there is also uh, almost as many people that say they want to enth enthusiastically embrace it. And we see that this affects everyone's adoption of AI throughout the whole of the church ecosystem. If leaders are feeling this way, then we know that congregations are also feeling this way. And those of us that lead ministries or you know, steer different Christian organizations are also affected by this stuff. So we need a framework, I think, in order to be able to make sure that more people are able to do this well, to put that foot on that accelerator pedal, but also that we have good guardrails in place to make sure that we do that sensibly. No? Always the way. Why, why does this matter? I just want to put it to you that, like, you may be in this room because you are thinking about AI, right? Raise your hand if that's you. you. You're actively involved in an AI project or are thinking about building AI tools. Okay, welcome to the 1%, <laughs> right? We in this room are a great com community of people dealing with some really interesting issues. But I would put it to you that the majority of church leaders across the country and around the world do not wake up every day thinking about what you're thinking about. They get up and think about, how am I gonna get this sermon prepared by the end of the week? They think about, what about this couple that's going through a divorce in my congregation? They think about, I need to hire a new administrator, if they're lucky enough to even to have the budget to do so. Or in my country, they're just worried about the roof falling in on their church that's been there since the 1500s. Like, this is problems that we deal with. But these are not the problems that they will deal with in the next decade. The problems they will deal with in the next decade is the young person coming to their youth leader and saying, I've fallen in love with the chatbot, what do I do? Do you think the average church leader is well equipped to answer that question? Or they might be asked with their you know, administrators saying, hey, we've been uh, taking attendance over the past six months and we've got these new cameras in the sanctuary. Can I apply face tracking software to them so I can check who's coming on a regular basis? Will they do that? Or they might just be simply saying, hey, I just want like, AI to write my sermon for me because I just don't have time this week. And you know, maybe I'll also get it to write the prayers at the end of the service as well. And should they? Could they? They can. These are the issues that I think the church will deal with over the next decade. And I put it to you guys that as much as we want to bring this technology into the church, we also need to bring answers to these questions into the church as well. Because if we want AI to be embraced fully, then we also need to have a good brake pedal to control it as well. We're seeing so many emergent use cases. I mentioned sermon prep, 
you know, worship planning. We're seeing examples of AI coming in to help with pastoral care and a, a, a hackathon that we were at just before Christmas. We did see actually live examples of people trying to build face tracking software to manage attendance records. This stuff is being worked on in different places. And you've seen here, even in the past 48 hours, examples of new AI tools that are coming to help with biblical literacy, to help with biblical interrogation, and, and to help people, you know, obviously take this to every tribe, every nation, every language. And so there is huge opportunity. So I really don't want you guys to take from this talk that like, this is not something we should be doing. We absolutely need to. In fact, it's imperative that if we really want to reach the world with the gospel, then we need the acceleration of this technology because Frankly, I don't think we're doing a great job of it without it. So we want to go after this stuff, but I want to put it to you that we need a framework to weigh this stuff up, not only against our own theology, but our own ethics. And we have a good one because we have the truth. We see examples in things like Bible Mate, Bible Chat, and so many other examples I could pull out. The biblical interrogation in particular is one of the real um, areas of uh, effort going in at the moment. But I think there are far more examples as we go beyond just the analysis of the Bible or the you know, kind of interpretation of Scripture where AI will begin to play a part in our church experiences. And so we need to take some time to really critically think about how that's going to affect us. I, you know, this is fun. Um, I can't honestly remember why I put this slide in here, but I think it's fun to look at. Um, what would Jesus prompt? Yeah, maybe that's the new the new band that we all need. So, AI ethics, just to kind of give you a few things to, to think about. Um, if for those of you that might have read this book, this is not a Christian resource uh, by my friend Marie Blackman. Um, fantastic piece of work uh, looking at the kind of the big issues in AI ethics. And bias and fairness in particular, I think, is one that we have had to pay an awful lot of attention to. If, if you haven't um, read this book, by the way, I, I do thoroughly recommend it. Um, it, it will give you a kind of good primer to building an AI ethical framework for your organization and, and particularly for your churches as well. But these issues, these are not new issues, right? We've been seeing this since the dawn of the internet. These are the same issues that we've been dealing with for a long time. But they have far outweighed impact now in our current circumstances. And whilst they're helpful to think about in the broad sense, we also need to bring more than just the technological issues to the table, but also the theological issues to them as well. You see, AI ethics starts with AI theology, and the thing is that we have a good AI ethic because we ha most of our ethics comes from, guess what, the Bible. <laughs> in most of Western democracy, if any of you have read Tom Holland's Dominion book, he accepts that basically in the Western world we cannot ex extricate ourselves from Christendom despite the fact that most of us would say that we wouldn't be Christian because it's so imbued into the way that our societies work. So we do have Christian ethics actually at the heart of most of what we're doing. But I think in particular around the issues of human dignity, justice and accountability, these are the things that we need to be asking ourselves when we build these experiences. When we build AI tools that you know, choose to replicate a person's voice or their image, are we taking that, the opportunity to give gainful employment to that person away from them? When we ask people to use AI to make judgment calls about whether or not we should employ someone or not, or a mortgage should be given to them or not, are we using the right you know, content to be able to fuel those experiences? And are you able to explain how your AI is able to do what your AI is able to do? For many, we know that this can be a problem. Like, explainability is also going to be a huge part in this framework. And so I want us to begin to think about a joint framework here. This is our, our kind of call to you as a part of this uh, conference. And, and the reason we're being here is to say, will you work with us to think about building a joined up AI ethics framework for the church? Because if we don't have this, I feel like we do have no really good leg to stand on. We can start projects left, right, and center. We can go after opportunities galore. We can invest and we can build. But if we don't all have a grounded and agreed understanding on what we will do and what we believe to be permissible, I think we will run into some real issues down the line. So some practical tips to think about as you're adopting AI in practice into your organization. Have you considered how AI is affecting the daily work of your organizations? Not just the thing that you are making that you know, is specifically an AI tool, for many of you that you're working on that, but actually how is AI going to affect those, you know, those that you seek to minister to and those that you seek to serve? Have you ev evaluated the current AI usage in your organizations? For those of you that are parts of large teams, do you actually know what tools are being used? <laughs> like I can say to you the amount of enterprises that I interact with who are like, we think we've got like 20 people using ChatGPT and then they find out there's like 100 more of them that have all put it on their personal credit cards. Like this stuff happens a lot. So have you actually got an understanding of what's being um, done inside of your organization? 
Have you developed an AI ethics policy? Is there something that is easily referenceable by your organization for those that do not spend their time coming to conferences about AI, <laughs> where they can look at it and say, yeah, that's what we will and we will not do with these tools, and this is where we will use them. And have you trained your staff on the risks of doing, you know, going outside of that policy? Do they understand what this will mean? Um, but most importantly is, are you bringing the broader opportunities and these issues to bear in the ministry that you're doing? Not just for the development of the tools, but for the actual outworking of this, um, this stuff in, in practice. So hopefully, this will kind of give us a, a starting point, but our call to action to all of you is to join in this work of beginning to think about what a shared AI ethical framework would look like for our organizations. I think the question is, it says here is not whether machines think, but whether men and women do. We have the opportunity to shape what this technology will be like. And I think it's also critically important that we are in this moment because you are the last group of Christian people building things in this space to remember what life was like before the robots came to help and after. And if we want to retain any of the good that came before and push it forward into what comes after, you're the people that are going to get to do that. No one else. It's us. And so if you want your youth workers to be able to answer the question of, what do I do when I fall in love with a chatbot? Or, you know, should we be putting cameras here? Or should we be tracking every word that someone has written into Microsoft Teams for their performance review at the end of the year? Some of you. <laughs> then you're the guys that get to choose that. And that's all of our jobs. Because AI ethics isn't one person's job. It's all of our jobs. So with that, I will say that you are the last of us. Make sure the robots help. And if you would like to join and get more involved in the uh, think tank and community that we're building at something I launched earlier this year called Ecclesiae, you can find out more here. Join us on Slack. Um, if you'd like to help uh, get your, those that you work with in ministry work more ready, uh, they can take the AI readiness test uh, that we developed in partnership with Glue at glue.us. And uh, yeah, find me online to help. But hopefully, this will give us a, a place to start from. And I just ask that whatever you do, you don't say, we will deal with it tomorrow. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Rue all the way from South Africa. Let's give her a massive round of applause and uh, welcome her. everyone. Um, am I audible? Okay, thank you. Um, so today I'm so excited to be here um, to speak about the work that we do in empowering the role um, of um, multilingual communities in South Africa. And um, we will look at um, how we can be able to actually advance um, the language resources for the communities that I'll be speaking about today. And as we delve into this topic, we'll explore the significance um, of multilingualism, and we'll also look at the challenges in the language resources when we are developing um, these languages. Okay, so looking at the South African approach to embracing and promoting multilingualism, um, it stands in contrast to other policies of many other African countries because they fear that allowing different languages and ethnicities can or would compromise their nation's unity. But with our case, we have a unique situation where um, we have 11, we had 11 official languages, and just last year we passed on to have our 12th language, which, which was sign language. So we are able to um, express ourselves in many different ways in one country and I think that is an advantage for us and a unique situation for us as a country to say that we are enabling or allowing the, 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 the people in the, in the country to be able to express themselves in the best way that they can possibly can. And so my passion for multilingualism actually stems from a desire to preserve um, promote as well as contributes to social cohesion and unity in the country. And in particular, my grandmother never got the opportunity to study um, in life due to circumstances when she was growing up in, in the country. And therefore, 
all she knows to speak is Isi Zulu, and that is my home language. The language, if you, if you think of the great Shaga Zulu, that's the clan that I belong to, and that's the language that I speak at home. So for me to be able to study languages and be able to be involved in developing all the different languages in my country um, is actually a privilege to say that I am able to be one of the people to say we are not only going to be focusing on a sole um, language, which was English back in the day, but we are also allowing other people in the, in the country to be able to express themselves in their mother tongue. So that's what um, the, 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 the passion behind all of this comes from for me personally. And so there's this famous quote by the late Nelson Mandela, which reads, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. With this quote, you already understand that when I'm speaking to um, an, an, an elderly person in a remote area or in South Africa, in, a, in the rural areas, if I come to them and speak to them in English, they will definitely never understand what I'm trying to say or what message I'm trying to bring across to them. But as soon as I relate and go a level lower and speak a language that they fully understand, they will be able to engage with me better because they will, they will be um, understanding the, concept, the concepts that I'm speaking about and they will get to be um, understanding the message clearly and fuller than if I was only just conversing in a single language with them. Okay, so um, South Africa, as I mentioned, we are known um, for its diverse um, linguistic le landscape with 12 official languages, and um, we have numerous other um, languages that are not um, official, but people do speak in different um, um, parts of the country. And this linguistics diversity is not just a matter of pride, for me, it's also crucial for preserving cultural and, and, and um, cultural heritage, rather, and also promoting um, um, identity. Because if I know um, the language that I speak well, I'm able to identify myself within the clan that I belong to. So that is a pride of joy for me to say, yes, I am the Isi Zulu speaker, and, I, and the next person can probably say, I am an Isi Kosa speaker, the language of the late Nelson Mandela. A lot of people will resonate to say, I belong with this clan and I belong with this particular culture, and that is how we are able to identify ourselves in, in, in the context of this linguistic diversity in the country. However, though, um, this richness also presents some challenges when we look at, um, in terms of language resource development. I mean, there's 12 languages. Which one do we work with? Which one do we um, think, oh, no, maybe we'll look at this a little bit later? Because in the country in itself, we have been mandated, constitutionally ma mandated, rather, to treat all of these languages equally. And that proves, um, or gives us a little bit of a challenge when we are developing the languages because there's so many of them. And we all want all of them to, be, uh, to reach an equal status um, in terms of um, resource development and ensuring that they are languages of teaching and learning within the country. Um, and the slide uh, in particular, we see uh, a population distribution indicating um, the um, indigenous low resource languages. And to my surprise, or to our surprise in, the, in, in this room right now, Isi Zulu, my language, is the most spoken language in the country. However, even though the language is the most spoken language, there is still not enough resources for the language in order for it to be developed and also in order for it to have human language technologies available in the country. Um, at the moment, English has a lot of resources as well as Afrikaans, which comes second, but all the other um, indigenous or um, African languages are finding themselves in a difficult um, situation where we do not have resources to actually build up um, these um, languages. So also on the right of the map, where, where you see the map, it also just indicates um, the regions where these um, different languages are spoken. So I mentioned that we do have some challenges, and one of the major challenges is the limited computational resources that are available. Additionally, there is also a lack of standardized tools and methods for language resources, um, resource development, which makes it difficult for, 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 for us um, to ensure that there's consistency and quality across um, the different languages. And addressing these challenges requires collaboration 
between various um, um, institutions and also ensuring that there is innovation in the field of developing these languages in our context. Okay, so I have this there just to give you an, an idea of how our languages are actually written. So these are the languages that I've mentioned that we are um, developing in the country, the official languages in the country. So the codification of most of our South African Bantu languages um, are not really revised. We're still using the old orthographical system. And when we want to develop um, um, computational tools or AI tools, it proves difficult because no one actually is following the correct standard way of, um, of, of writing or the orthographical way of writing um, the, 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 the different languages. And that becomes a little bit of a challenge when we develop the tools and develop these um, um, AI um, tools to assist us to, to, to be of a better help um, to the communities to say that when there is no standard way of writing or documenting a, a particular language, then how do we then develop the tools? How do we then um, um, get the, the, the the, the resources out to the people if the orthography itself is a little bit problematic. You, um, the, the, the languages are a little bit slow in, 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 in that manner to say that there is no um, fast-paced way of doing this and also uh, in, ensuring, in ensuring that we're developing it in the way that maybe the people in the West, in this, in this part of the world, how, and how they are doing it. So for us, it's a little bit of a challenge to say that we are still even now trying to get our orthographies right. We are still even now trying to adhere to the spelling conventions in our, in, in our languages, and that now also proves uh, as the challenge for us when we are developing any materials or any resources to advance our languages. So this affects the development and performance of language tools, as you may um, Im imagine already. So I'd like to introduce the company that I work for, or rather the organization that I work for. Um, it is the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, and we play a role, a crucial role, in promoting and preserving um, the, the South Africa's languages through development of language, um, digital language resources, and our mandate also includes supporting research and education in linguistic diversity and providing resources and tools for language um, practitioners. So our existence actually is to address some of the challenges that I've spoken about to say that we are here and we are working as trained linguists and also um, to assist in ensuring that whatever tools that are developed and whatever AI um, assistant tools that are, are, are being put out there, we are the ones who can be able to assist the developers to say, actually, this is how you do this in, uh, in, in, in um, the linguistic manner, instead of just maybe applying the same rules to English and think it will fit when you, when you uh, developing a tool for Isizulu. So that is why we are saying that we are wanting to be able to collaborate with the developers of these tools so that we can assist them better to ensure that the tools actually perform in a much better way when they are developed to assist us um, as, a, a, as a country with our languages. Um, and so we are a multi-partner entity, so we do not do all of this work on our own. Um, in the country, we have the assistance or rather we have linked nodes and they are from various institutions as listed on the slide up there. They assist us with different um, specialization. We have the digitization node which lies with the University of Pretoria, um, the, the, the text um, node which is in the Northwest University, as well as the multilingual um, linguistic terminology node which is uh, focused on the University of South Africa itself, and well as other nodes, the, um, the child um, speech node, which is in the Stellenbosch University, CSIR is responsible for speech, and then I sell that lastly is responsible for language development and assessment. So we work in collaboration with all of these institutions and we're not doing the work on our own because we need all the help that we can get. I mean, if we are going to be developing this for the whole country, we need to be, have, um, to be able to work in, 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 in collaboration with other um, um, bodies that are working in a similar fashion within the country in, in, in our context. So I would just like, as I mentioned that, we are a multilingual um, center. I would like to play a video that will also just sum up what I've spoken about now 
so that you can get to hear firsthand the flair of being a multilingual center and hear the different languages that are spoken within our center. And funny, funny enough is that we are still able to hear one another and understand each other even though our languages are different in, 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 in that way. is die Suid-Afrikaanse Centrum vir Digitale Taalhulpbronne, ook bekend as Sadilar, as deel van die Suid-Afrikaanse Navorsings Infrastruktuur Padkaart in die lewe geroep. Sadilar is een voorbeeld van die navorsingsstrukture wat op die been gebring word om hier die ontwikkelings- en navorsingsleemte aan te spreek. Sadilar voorsien ook in die behoefte om ons inheemse landstale te bevorder. Sadila, this is the house we had as a son and not to move Africa. Kabopar, Mosadila, Rene Pisha was a bola malema as a mushuk Africa war. Kaudira dinakishi shoka moholo abelana didirishwa, ja digital maleming au gamok. Ofeta foul, repel la hotsebe of Jalaka se teo samo teo sao abelana, gadidirishwa tapole. Morero moholo was a teo sarena. Kawasha kusha. Malema arena asetu lewo aboluka kaho shabu la lo abelona sisi wa sata di moshi ya didiri shaje cha technology rawo lo fela hore maita pisho amahole a banya kishishi baba muba cha malema monari ata tuusha morero mwa matafatu ya wui pona kaja hucha digital leleme lele mo lele home meka moso arichuela mukola mukola la miloko ya kamoso malema a Yes, that's us, and this is what we do at Sarila, and it assists also to ensure that the generations to come have these languages documented, then they are able to also do research on them, and also just understand how maybe um, the languages have changed over time. So this is why we are in existence as um, a research infrastructure. So I think I'm going to move to the next one. Yes. So, the establishment of Sadila, as you may have already seen in that uh, clip in the subtitles, is that we are in, in um, we were established to mark a significant step towards addressing the scarcity of resources for indigenous languages, and we are funded by the government, which is the, di the Department of Science and Innovation, which provides a crucial um, funding for our operations, and also the programs that we are focusing on are the digitization program as well as the digital humanities program, which are at the core of all of, the, of, all of what we are doing um, at, as, a, as a, a, re a research in infrastructure. So, so just to show you some of the stuff that we have available in our repository um, as an impact to the community of South Africa, we are responsible for curating 
development distribution as well as maintenance of the language resources. These are the available um, resources that we have in our cellular repo. When you get the slides, you'll be able to click directly on those um, links so that you can be able to have access um, to them and see what we have. Maybe it can be useful to you. Maybe you'd like um, you'd be interested to look at what we have and what we offer as um, a research center. Click too hard. Okay, so. So these are outputs that have actually made news. I particularly um, chose these two because they've made news in the country of the great work that we, that, that we did on the, see the, 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 the person with the pen in hand, we have developed spell checkers for all the, the languages in the country. And actually it gave me personally a sense of relief because whenever I would type something out on Microsoft Word, it would always be underlined in red all the time. Everything would just, would just bleed red ink on it. So it was a little bit of a, um, a, a challenge to say that even when I'm reading text, I'm not sure if maybe I've overlooked an error as I've typed because literally everything will be read. Right now it's much better because I can at least identify if I've made an error, maybe a word or two would be underlined and then the rest of the document will be at least no, no longer be bleeding red. So that is something that has, uh, um, actually that has been a great help to a lot of language practitioners and people that are using um, Microsoft Word to type out documents in our language. And the second um, uh, output or impact that we've had on the, on the right, the, that brown cover there, is a dictionary of a language of the sand people. So we currently have only one remaining speaker of the language, and we were able to actually develop a dictionary with her assistance, and that is actually great to say that even generations to come will be able to know that there was the language that actually existed, and it was documented, and the name of the language is the, is the new language. And you will also be able to hear this, the speaker, the, the last remaining speaker of the language speak about um, the, the impact that this project actually had um, on her and her community. So looking at collaborations and partnerships that we've had as a center, the Department of Higher Education passed out an implementation of the new language policy to assist um, and include students to epistemological access in the content that they're receiving in classrooms. Um, we have a lot of students that come from very rural areas in the country that have little to no knowledge of English at all. And then when they get to university, they are being taught in English. And that um, proves to be a challenge to them. They do not understand the concepts, the concepts that are, are being taught in class because they would first have to decode the information um, receive the information in English and try to decode it again into their, um, um, their mother tongue to be able to understand what is going on in the classroom. So with this um, particular new language promise, uh, policy has actually assisted in enforcing and, in, and in, in ensuring that all students are getting the same knowledge at the same time, that when the lecturer is teaching in English, there is someone in the ear that is translating the lesson to the students in their mother tongue in the classroom. So that has really been a great movement from, for, um, for, from the government side in ensuring that we are embracing ourselves as a multilingual um, um, community and a multilingual country in South Africa. And then the second um, collaboration partnerships we've had is between ourselves, um, Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia South Africa, that is, and the Pan-South African Language Board in ensuring that um, um, to, to, to encourage language communities to actively contribute content to the free um, encyclopedia. And also this project in itself is aimed at promoting all of South Africa's indigenous languages um, in ensuring that they are, have, that they do have an online presence. And with that, I, I, I want to now play that video from the last remaining speaker of the new language, and that'll be my conclusion um, with, with, with this presentation so that you can hear, get to hear the impact that we've made when we were actually uh, part of this project and the, the, the lasting effect that will come for generations to come in, in being able to document and have this dictionary available for people that are wanting to do research on the language.
Eu agora sinto um espreitar. E mei mês a frislak ik ga sterven, maar die taal ga praten. Zo ga sterven, dat ons later net vuur geworden. Dat is die slechte dan gemakkelijk dat die taal tot gegaan. Maar ik praat mijn taal. En ik wel mensen leer. Mijn hoop is voor die mensen om die taal te herkennen en die taal te verstaan. En alle met hem praat, alle met hem hoor en praat en luisteren. Wat hem vast en hou vast. Ik kan hem vast gaan doen, maar ik wil taal leren. Thank you. And just to conclude, as um, a rounding of my presentation, so we see the value of, the, of developing the um, digital language resources and how crucial it is for indigenous people of South Africa. These resources also enable a full functionality and intelle intellectualization of indigenous um, people. And also they help to preserve cultural heritage and to promote inclusivity as well as diversity. Thank you so much. Um, up next, we have Ryder Wishart. All right, good to see everyone. So this morning, uh, we've heard a number of very interesting things already. Uh, I want to ask about Bible translation in particular, and I want to talk about taking stock of AI. Uh, of course, I mean machine learning by AI, but um, and also using some large language models, but let's be precise like uh, we were invited to yesterday. So <clears throat> I would say the, uh, the, that AI is now, uh, it's here. Uh, we can talk about uh, breaks, as uh, James mentioned, uh, which is a valuable discussion, but I think if we look at the Gutenberg moment that he described, uh, we don't really talk about breaks when it, uh, when it comes to publishing and paper and the, print, the printing press and all of its sort of subsequent iterations. Um, those things have happened and it's come and gone and people have published really bad things. But we've also published a lot of Bibles. We've published a lot of good things. And I think we're going to be able to do that with generative AI or word calculators, as I like to call them. We've had calculators for a while. Now we have word calculators. Um, but we, I want to ask, have we really thought about the implications for Bible translation? Have we really thought about them? We've thought about ways to apply them to what we're currently doing. But I love this quote from Henry Ford. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. Well, if we ask what you want from AI for Bible translation, you might be thinking, I want faster checking of this sort. I want faster drafting in this way. But maybe we need to step back a little bit and say, well, well, and ask ourselves, what does it actually take to translate the Bible today? Because a lot has changed, and a lot has changed even in the last year or two. And so we need to ask this question, and we need to ask it with openness. What does it take? It doesn't necessarily take everything that we have been doing. Maybe it does. Maybe we can do those things faster. And maybe in some contexts it does. Probably the answer is going to be it depends. But I want to talk about a few different aspects of uh, how AI has and can impact Bible translation. And the first thing I want to talk about is the process of Bible translation, which I've been learning about a lot uh, as I've been working on some of these tools. And this is the kind of picture. I didn't ask anybody for confirmation about whether this is the way it works. This is the picture I've uh, picked up along the way. Uh, and it's that we first draft a Bible, then the translator will check it themselves, then they'll bring it to their team, their team will check it, then an external consultant will come and check it, and then finally you have the publishing process which involves uh, typesetting and other editorial checks. But I've also uh, heard and I can understand that this process involves some bottlenecks. So 
what happens is we get some drafts, some nice uh, fancy new drafts, and then we want to bring those drafts, once they're completed, to the team. Well, that creates a bit of a bottleneck or pile up because we have to wait on the team to get done with the checking. Then we've got to wait on the consultant to get done with the checking. And then we've got to wait again on the publishers to get done with the publishing. And this is a process we're using, and it's working because we're publishing Bibles. But now the question is, does AI mean, well, let's do more of that, but let's just do it faster? Well, the problem is we've got bottlenecks there. Bottlenecks can only go so fast. If you put more sand into an hourglass, the time is still going to pass at exactly the same rate because you've got a narrow neck on an hourglass. And so instead of moving faster, we're just going to get more of these and more of these. We're going to get all these drafts, you know, churned out. But then that will just cause a greater pileup downstream. And that's what could happen. Now, I want to suggest that this is, if we're thinking about the process of Bible translation, we might think about it as, you know, this kind of process we're planning for. We set the course, and off we go, and we fly in a nice straight line. But uh, everyone looking at this, you can just turn your head for a moment, a little bit to your right, and notice what's happened. It's still straight, but now it's going a different direction. If you, when you're flying, if you're one degree off of your path, then every 60 miles, you're going to be one mile out from your destination. And so if we have this nice linear process, well, if I do drafting and I complete a lot of drafting and then I do checking, well, I might be way off my mark. We don't fly airplanes like that. Uh, we don't write code like that. Hopefully we don't. It's not like I draft my entire app and then after about six months, I sit down and I say, okay, I'm ready to compile it, <laughs> try compiling it. And then I hit, you know, I hit let's say a thousand errors in a row and by that time I've completely, you know, we've, we've moved on to another project. I think that's called the waterfall approach. Well, the solution, of course, uh, with flying, as we know, is to steer. You have to steer. And what's really interesting about steering is it implies that you hit quality problems all the time. You hit them uh, constantly, but you fix them really quickly. You fix them right away and then it doesn't cause you to be way off your mark once you, uh, you're a thousand miles into the journey. And so I want to suggest that as we're thinking about how AI can apply to the Bible translation process, we can think about a slightly different kind of process, one where drafting and checking are actually the same step. Because what's the difference between drafting and redrafting based on feedback? Well, they're kind of similar, right? I'm writing or I'm revising. When I write papers, this is, that's the process I follow. I check stuff as I go. I don't quote everybody, all the scholars I need to quote, and then later I go and check. Did they say that? Uh, that would, well, if I used AI to write my papers, then that, that would, that's how it would work, I suppose. Got to go and do some quality checking. Uh, and then publishing and feedback, they can be actually part of the same process. We can iteratively publish. And again, this implies that we're going to hit lots of quality problems. AI drafting, as you know, will produce low quality results a lot of the time. But if that's actually part of the process, then we can embrace that and recognize, oh, this is actually helping us steer the translation process. And that's helping us get to that publishing stage a lot faster. So. Uh, what does it actually mean to steer the translation process? Well, one way is you provide the right indicators. You provide the right indicators for translators. Uh, you saw some of this with Damien's presentation yesterday with links, a framework for how do we actually show translators the information they need to know so they can check their work immediately. Uh, another way is with ingesting information. If everything you need to learn can be asked in a social context, in a chat kind of context, um, that's one way you can steer the translator because they don't have to sort of set off on, embark on this journey of researching a problem that they don't even know the, uh, they don't know how to ask questions about. They can just start querying and start trying to suggest, well, is this what that means? Is this what this word means? 
uh, and they can get answers that are based on the resources that they have downloaded or in their project. Uh, everything you want to fix, if everything you want to fix just shows up as a kind of squiggly line, that's how, I mean, you just heard about uh, Microsoft Word and uh, little red squiggly lines. Well, uh, what, that, what that's intended to show you is this is an unknown spelling. Uh, now, of course, that means we actually need tools that are designed to deal with languages that don't have a dictionary. They don't have a built-in spell checker. So we have to build those things as, as the translator is working. Uh, if you ha use AI for writing, you want it to show up as simple inline suggestions. And then, of course, you want an AI co-pilot to do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, the things that, anything that is repetitive in the process is a process or a piece of the process that's ripe for AI innovation. So there's a number of different ways that we could apply that, um, whether it's on demand for a, a verse or lots of different versions of a verse that are being drafted or uh, a complete zero draft, a draft that's meant to be changed. So let's talk about progress a little bit. Um, I'll, uh, I'll skip over, uh, I suppose I'll skip over a few of my uh, slides here. I'll go quickly over them, but uh, you can always follow up with them later. I'll have a link at the end. Uh, but I want to just highlight especially uh, this quote. And uh, the goal of this translator's co-pilot that we've been building is to make the translation technology disappear as much as possible so that you don't have to pay attention to it uh, as much as you might have. You don't have to uh, spend a lot of time learning how to use it. You do have to spend some time, you know, of course, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, but I really have been inspired by this quote here, that the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of your everyday life and work. And so we've kind of adopted this approach where uh, what you need to see here is there's this AI agent here. Uh, and this is a, a word calculator, of course, there's no in intelligence there, but it makes quasi decisions. And the key to this whole thing is it doesn't matter how complicated things are on the left or the right, right side, yeah, the right side of the uh, process, you can make it really complicated under the hood. But what the user sees is just a simple interface. They only see what's relevant to them. They don't need to know about all the steps that went into getting you there. Uh, you do want them to be able to inspect that, as James mentioned as well. You want, them to, you want to be able to explain what the process was. Uh, but they don't have to look into it every time. They don't have to see it all happening. Uh, now, if you imagine a cockpit in an airplane and a co-pilot, you notice that a co-pilot also has instruments in front of them. They have instruments and controls. Because a co-pilot has to be able to do something. You need some basic tools. And so a lot of what we've been building over the past few months while we've been working on this is some basic tools that a co-pilot can actually leverage. And so we've been working on uh, what we've called the Codex Scripture Editor. Now, uh, those who are programmers in the room will appreciate this. We, uh, we took VS Code, Microsoft VS Code, and we forked VS Code because we said, well, this is a pretty good text editor. Uh, it's actually a world-class text editor. And so if we just take this software and copy it, it gives us a lot of opportunity. And I can already, oh, I can see that the next transition here is going to, look pretty bad because it's exported to PowerPoint. Ooh, that's terrible. Uh, but what we've done is we've tried to build tools for that steering process. Uh, but the other thing we've done is we've tried to adopt not only an open source approach, but an open ownership approach. So what we're doing, we're putting together this app. It's intended to be a white labeled app. So anybody from any church or organization around the world can actually take it, make their own copy, slap their own label on it, and they can not only work on it, but they can own it. It can be theirs. They can make whatever decisions they need to make uh, because they're the ones who are closest to the problem, and they know what decisions they need to make. Uh, you can go to that website and download it. I got a QR code at the end as well. And uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, essentially there's a, a repository, VS Codium, that builds the VS Code app, and we have forked that, and we're... Uh, right now, we have a, a second version of the Scribe Scripture Editor. Uh, you can look more into this if you want, or talk to me, or you can talk to Joel Matthew as well, who's here. And uh, the idea is that we want other people to be able to make some other copy that they want. If they need to have total ownership over whatever app they're using, go for it. And everything, every extension we build for this app will be compatible across any instance of it. 
Um, so I'll just, I'll just gloss over a couple features here, but uh, this is spell checking that's happening. You notice if there's an unknown spelling, so they're, you know, spelling genealogy with an O, that's how it sounds. So obviously it should be spelled like that, but it's not. Uh, it gets corrected here because uh, we've seen that word genealogy before. Uh, of course, that's for English, but this actually works, as you saw with the Greek room presentation yesterday, with low resource languages as well. Uh, there's more and more uh, pieces of the Greek room that we're pulling into this spell checker. And it, it really doesn't matter, again, how complicated it is under the hood. What all you see is this little squiggly line. You can see, oh, that's an unknown spelling. Now, in this case, uh, there's two simple checks going on here uh, all the time. So one of them is if you start drafting a, a sentence and it looks really uh, strange compared to how you've been translating so far, we'll try to detect those anomalies and just let the user know about that. Uh, now, they could ignore it and say, no, 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 I really intended to do that. That's fine. But we'll try to catch those things so that if you make a simple mistake like, oh, yeah, I forgot to put anything in that verse. I just I was going to come back to it and totally forgot. Well, you've got a little error message for you. Uh, and the other one is that if you duplicate verse references or you put them out of order, uh, you get a little indicator as well. And this all happens instantly, as soon as you make the mistake, as it were. Uh, you can also do semantic search on the translation memory. So as you're drafting, uh, you can if you highlight a word, or you uh, put some text into that text box there. Uh, we're going to work on the UI. I'll just say <laughs> some of the UX and UI people there are cringing uh, because we built it so quickly. But uh, um, that wasn't, uh, yeah, w we, uh, we, we want to make it as simple as possible. Um, but the idea here is that you can select text, and it, it will search through your draft and find the most semantically similar passages so that you can compare. Well, how did we translate something like that before? And I think we've already done something like this. Um, so, we also, you heard yesterday about identifying mixed scripts. So, this is the Wildebeest library that uh, Ulf has made, and uh, we just stuck it in there. So, if you start typing Hebrew, it's going to tell you, hey, you've mostly got Latin characters there, and now you've got Hebrew. Are you sure you want that? And then, uh, you, some of you have heard about the Bible Aquifer. Uh, you can look that up if you haven't. It's supposed to be a, a large repository of data localized into a lot of languages. I just hard-coded English as the language for this uh, instance, but if you have VS Code on your computer right now, you can go to the extension store and look up Bible Aquifer and download it and try it out, and then, um, you know, go, go find the repository and contribute to it so it supports images, because I never rendered those. Uh, you can also download localized resources from Unfolding Word. Uh, the Unfolding Word team worked on this, uh, they, and actually the Scribe team, they took this component for downloading uh, localized resources, and they pulled it over and just dropped it into VS Code. Uh, and uh, essentially, you can take you know, some React component or React app. Sorry, I'm talking to programmers now. And you can say, uh, what, you can go and ask ChatGPT, hey, turn this into a VS Code extension for me. And it'll basically walk you through it, and maybe it'll even work out of the box. Um, this, I had to split it up because it was pretty tall and the font was small. Sorry about that. But uh, there's a chat bot that's built in that has access to your translation. And so you can ask questions, and it'll search for relevant context in your project, and then you can chat with it and ask for suggestions. And uh, I, I put in there, you know, maybe, maybe Bible.ai could power that chat bot so that uh, it can be uh, accessing a lot of good resources and be uh, nicely aligned with the purposes of Bible translation. Uh, but this is actually running on a local LLM on my computer. Many of you will have computers that can run large language models on them. Uh, we just run this app called LM Studio. LM Studio. It's a free app. You download it. You download a model, hit start server, and suddenly you've got your own local uh, chat GPT running. And you can swap out models if you want one that works for your language better. Uh, but uh, we've also, with, with the large language models, you can see here that you can have um, translation suggestions. You won't be able to read it, but what you can see is there's some ghost writing going on. And if you hit tab, it will accept the suggestion. Or you can just keep typing and ignore it. And this is all coming through offline and uh, privately, and it's based on the context of your project. Now, that's English, which seems easy to do. So I thought I should throw in an example of, this is uh, Talk Pisin here. If you start typing Talk Pisin, it'll start suggesting Talk Pisin. Now, the lower resourced the language, and the less you've put into your project so far, the less good the quality of the results are going to be. Um, but it's already got, you've got something started there. Now, if you can't run a large language model on your computer, because maybe you've got a, a Windows computer, no, I'm just kidding, an old one, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there's also statistical predictions. And I won't go into the details, but uh, da Daniel Losey is here, one of the developers I work with. And he made some remarkable, uh, really cool, really fast statistical prediction models or uh, tools that are always based on your project. So if you, as soon as you type, so he types generations here, uh, as soon as you do that, the statistics are already updated. And as soon as you keep typing your next verse, you've got uh, better results already. Um, some of the benefits of this approach that we've tried to uh, emphasize for the use case we have in particular for piloting it is it needed to be offline. So it needed to work offline. Only the Bible aquifer is online because that's connecting to an API. Um, but all of the other things are working offline. Uh, local, they're private. Um, and uh, you can sync, sync your data up with the cloud because that's built into VS Code as well. Um, if, uh, if you do want to run it and not have it on your computer, uh, you can actually run VS Code completely in a browser as well if you know, confiscation of a device is a, is a concern. Um, so another thing is we've tried to keep a just-in-time approach that uh, whatever you need, it's there just when you need it. You don't get overwhelmed with, well, I have to browse through. You know, I've got some big lexicons on my shelf, and um, I often don't even open them. I just search the internet because it's just less, it's less intimidating. Well, no, it's actually faster. Um, and then another thing is we always wanted the tools to be based on the current project state. So whatever any, I, I always think of the analogy of a pond, that when you touch a po little pond, the ripples will spread out and fill the whole pond. And I think translating should be just like that. Anytime you, a translator makes a change or interacts with their project, the changes should propagate out to the rest of the project and the rest of the tools, so that all the tools are always aware of the current state of your project, and they're always aware of the current state of your translation and every change you've made. Uh, and, so, and also, we're trying to focus on tools for zero resource languages, so we don't assume that we know anything about the language that you're translating into, so we don't have a massive list of you know, spelling words and all that, uh, that all has to get built on the fly. And so these are yeah, ways we're trying to implement steering in, uh, in translation. Uh, so, and I'll briefly mention a little bit of the potential here. So where could this take us? Well, uh, I don't probably need to convince a lot of you, but this is gonna really help accelerate, I think. This AI is gonna help accelerate church-led translation. That the churches will own the projects, maybe even own the tools, and they'll be able to translate faster when they need to without asking permission from anybody. Uh, we can also, we're working towards truly multimodal translation, not just, well, sometimes you do it in audio, sometimes you do it in text, but if you start with audio, maybe you want to move towards text eventually. Or if you have text, it's often beneficial to have an audio Bible as well, as we know. So you should be able to do both, uh, and the translator should be empowered to do both of those things. And that's, uh, the goal is to translate for human life, right? Because how, how many different modes do we actually communicate in? Well, like many different modes. So we, should, we ought to be translating for all of those modes if possible. Um, and I didn't mention multi, multilingual translation, but the Bible, of course, is a multilingual document. We impose one language on a translation, but it's actually got three languages in it to start with. And iterative publishing is, I think, a very important thing, that as soon as you finish a chapter, it should be able to fire up to some particular uh, distribution channel that works for that community, for that team, for whatever they're doing, for people to actually review. And this should happen uh, automatically. The feedback should come right back, and maybe your AI co-pilot gets to read that feedback as it's suggesting drafts and gets to improve what it's suggesting for you. And then, uh, yeah, that, I mean, the model is not a once-in-a-lifetime leather-bound Bible necessarily, but uh, it's a multi-generational Bible. And it, as you know, languages change, so it's always a moving target. So when we think about publishing, if we're only thinking in terms of getting that final leather-bound copy, well, in a couple generations, we're going to need another one because people won't be able to read it or understand it. Uh, this slows down the more public, the more uh, literate the culture is. It slows down the process a bit, uh, but as you know, if you try to read, I have a Discord channel uh, that I'm on with my youth group, and I didn't realize how many and varied the applications were of the skull emoji. The skull emoji. I've learned so much about the skull emoji. It's very helpful. Um, it's great. I'm so glad English is like that now, or emoji. And then um, uh, maybe, though, maybe you want to publish a leather-bound Bible. Well, if we have an open ownership model, 
not just a share-alike model, because if you have a share-alike model, but you need to, you, you're not allowed to sell that. But if you want to publish a leather-bound Bible, you've got to offset the cost somehow. Now, for many, in many cases, that won't be a problem. But if it's a public domain AI-drafted uh, text, then nobody even needs to ask. It's theirs if they want it. They can change it, adapt it, fix it, and try again uh, as much as they want. Um, so that the, we, the idea would be that ownership decisions rest in the hands of the people to whom it is most important. And so my question is, are you open to the changes that AI can bring? And I've just mentioned a number of things, but there's so much more we could talk about. Um, so there's a little summary there of the, dis the discussion. And you can go to this website and download Scribe, this new version of Scribe for yourself and try it out. Um, we are fixing the onboarding process or the project initialization process. Uh, a lot of this is in, in, uh, in progress, so when you encounter problems, which you will, you can email me, and uh, we want to hear how, what kind of problems people have installing it on different machines, and um, we've got, Ar Arch Linux is a known problem, okay? If you have Arch Linux, um, you don't have a global Python environment, so, you know, you can actually email me too, I know how to fix it, so. Anyways, <laughs> all right, thank you so much for your attention, I appreciate it. Thanks, Ryder. Uh, let's give all of our uh, speakers from this morning another round of applause. That was awesome. Um, I've made a special request. Um, so, so Dal actually funded uh, all of you to have half drank chocolate milks. Um, they've been sitting in his car for a while, so those are out in the lobby. Um, so coffee break for 30 minutes. Uh, make sure you're back on time. We have amazing content to continue. So uh, grab some coffee, um, get some cookies and, and chocolate milk.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting in three minutes' time. Please take your seats and come back into the auditorium. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to commence. Hello, everyone. If everyone could come and find their seat. Going to get started. All right. So my name is Joshua Seal, and I'm the chair of the Missional AI Summit. And I just want to say, first of all, um, it's incredible to have you all here. I think, you know, planning this conference over the last few months to actually be in this room and see the conversations and hear the talks and see the connections being made is you know nothing short of incredible so i just want to say thank you thank you for coming participating being a part of this summit um i think one of the things we've been wrestling with over this last year is how uh so every year we we do an incredible amount of work to get this conference um to happen and it's great we'll continue to do it um, but one of the things we've we felt is, you know, there's a need for community throughout the year. There's, you know, incredible conversations that happen here, but, um, you know, it, it, it is a challenge to continue those throughout the year. So one thing we, we've been thinking about is how can we build a community around this conference? And so today we wanted to announce, invite um, you to something we're calling AI Collective. And the idea is that we can take some of the community elements that take part in this conference and, and, and have those throughout the year. So I want to hand this over to Christine from Faith Tech really quick to explain a bit more. Um, thanks so much, Joshua. So as he said, uh, there is a need to continue the conversation. And as all of you know, with the pace at which this field is moving, that's, that's imperative. So what exactly is the AI Collective? So as you said, it's a global AI community and it spans all the way from people who are like the practitioners to like the deep thinkers, the strategists. Just getting this community together to just dialogue. And uh, the goal is to hit some of like the key audiences, whether it's the ministry leaders, the, the tech builders, the community of builders, as well as the folks who are thinking about the venture farms and the funding. So, this whole ecosystem has to come together to continue this conversation, and that's what the AI Collective is, and what will we do? Well, as part of that community, that is something that you can help us determine, but it could include content, podcasts that actually addresses all of these different key communities. It is the community itself that actually helps produce this content, and in addition to that, it's like all of the different resources that are required to actually put this all together. So in a nutshell, what's gonna happen next is, if you go to this website, it's a landing page for now. In mid-May, we wanna start collecting the feedback from everyone that we talk to, come, uh, come chat with any of us, and then uh, kind of put together what is the first step. So in mid-May, we're gonna have like a, a Zoom call, a calendar where people can come in and bring in their input. As well, we want to continue conversations and see what we can do for the different communities and the different resources that are required to kind of keep this going. We are trying to go for something, uh, we want to be something that is neutral, so we definitely want to think about things like governance, that's very key. We we'll also want to make sure that we're working with all of the different key players. So you heard earlier today, there are other groups that are also thinking about building community this is gonna be like complementary. it's not and. We do not wanna du duplicate work. So that's what the AI Collective is, and would love for you to join the movement.
So yeah, if you would go to aicollective.faith, that's the website. Obviously, this QR code will take you there. Um, and yeah, we're planning first first gathering somewhere around mid-May. So hope to see you all there. And then I would like to um, introduce our next speaker. So the next speaker is Eric Celsier. So would you guys give a warm welcome to him? Seven seconds. That's usually the time it's taking us to judge someone. So it's why I waited a little bit before you, you hear my accent. <laughs> so please give me 20 minutes and then judge me, okay, after that. Um, by the way, regarding my accent, a few years ago I was speaking at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association Board and uh, I really try hard to, to speak with a good accent. And at the end of my, uh, my speech to the board, Billy Graham said to me, first thing he said, he said, I really love your accent, your accent. And thank you for what you are doing for us. So since that time, I'm not trying to improve because Billy Graham said to me, love my accent, okay? So. And by the way, thank you, James, James Poulter, for setting up the stage for me by imitating French accent. And I really apologize for what happened to you in Paris, okay? And I apologize to all Americans who had bad experience in Paris or in France, okay? So, greetings to, to each of you. And uh, um, special thanks to the organizer of this conference, special thanks to the technician, special thanks to, to the to the people who are doing the sign language. And I, and I also thank my son, Benjamin. We cross uh, the ocean together uh, for this 20 minutes presentation. So it's important for us um, that we can, we can have this time together. Um, thanks to the speaker, Dr. K, for uh, starting yesterday and, and each of you. So I would like to Push the button first. Okay, that's my topic. So why I am committed since many years? I, since I'm, I'm a young guy, I'm using technology to help people to, to know Jesus and to grow in their faith. So I will explain you a little bit later uh, what I started and what I'm doing. but. I have a local church, maybe you have a local church, and in my church, we use technology uh, quite extensively. It's in France, and you know France is not an easy country for the gospel. Uh, but last service, baptism service, if sometime you don't understand what I'm saying, just correct me, and, uh, and I will be okay with that, okay? Baptism service, we baptized, it was a month ago, 164 people in one baptism service. And most of these people are young people and they watch first the online church before coming to the building. Um, so I, I know that we can use technology for God's kingdom. I do it in my local church, but more globally too. And I would like to show just to you um, this is my pastor, a young guy, bright guy. His name is Ivan Carluer. And here he is speaking in French. Frère aîné. Il n'a pas donné seulement sa circoncision. Mon frère aîné qui était juif et qui s'appelle Jésus Christ. Okay, that's French. De... But here, he's speaking in English. And thanks to AI. So it's his voice, still his voice. My older brother, he did not only give his circumcision, my older brother who was Jewish and who is called Jesus Christ of Nazareth came to earth to say that. But here he's speaking in Arabic. 
جاء أخي الأكبر الذي كان يهوديا ويدعى يسوع المسيح من الناصرة ليقول أن الله لم يعد يطالب بخدمة Because of that, we will start uh, churches for this language, for different languages group, thanks to AI. So, okay? And so that's just an example of the use of AI that is, can be innovative and can really help God's kingdom. So maybe next year we will have much more baptism in one service. It's not that we are trying to break records, but God is doing something great in France. So, um, my vision and commitment. So, I really, I have a strong belief in technology for advance the church and advance the kingdom of God. I'm trying to help ministries, I'm trying to help uh, pastors. In fact, oh, that was the one before. Okay, so a little bit of my background. I, I started my first website in 1997. I was planting a church in France, and I, I, I made my first website. I didn't know it was the first website for a church in France. And since that time, I always try to use technology to advance the church or, or to advance God's kingdom. So it's why... Uh, more than 15 years ago, I founded Jesus.net, which is, in fact, a cooperation of 130 organizations working together. And several of these organizations are in this room. I see my friend, Henry Kroll, from Poland. He's part of Jesus.net and doing a wonderful work. I see uh, uh, people from Uversion in the room, from uh, Glue in the room, from... Uh, Christian Vision and other organization, and I'm so glad we can cooperate. And that's the topic of this conference. It's about cooperation for God's kingdom. Um, I also serve as a author uh, in French language, as you can understand. I'm also a spiritual advisor for special people like the president of Madagascar, and I'm also a consultant in artificial intelligence intelligence, and digital strategy. Why, why I'm sharing that? Not to boast myself at all, but because what I will share just after, I would like you to give a little bit of credit to that, okay? Or to attention to it. So, I wrote my first AI project in 2009 about how to use the AI for the Bible. Uh, technology was not ready. In 2000. Uh, I mean, seven, eight years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., speaking about AI for the Bible. And we were raising ethical issues already at, at this time. And because of the progress of technology, these last months, we were able to, uh, uh, to really accelerate. And we are here for that. Um, you know, sometimes we don't talk about the elephant in the room. So let's talk just... One second about, a few seconds about the elephants in the room. I will be 60 years old uh, soon. And I see a bunch of elephants in this room, old elephants. But I just want to congratulate you because you are still in the race. You are still, you still want to do something. You still have the passion for God's kingdom and to use technology. We just need to help the new generation, the best way we can. So I want to thank the elephants in the room. They will recognize, I don't want to, to give names, but I think about some of you, okay? Uh, about an elephant, do you know who is this guy? Someone knows? Oh yeah, good. His name is Jan Lecun. He was born in 1960 and his job is to be the chief of AI for Meta. And by the way, he's a French guy. So, Cocorico, Cococolo, Duldu, as you say in, in, in English. We say Cocorico. So, that means that old people can do something, okay? So, I want to encourage the old people in the room, like me. So, current action. 
I would like to share with you. So I started really uh, to develop a project, but I, I will not speak too much about this project. It's called Hello Bible, and it's basically an application. We use artificial intelligence to answer questions of people. And we do it in the French-speaking world. We will do it soon in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world. So I want to show you a one minute, just a one minute presentation in English. Imagine a search engine specially oh. designed for the Bible. You ask your question, and thanks to intelligent analysis, HelloBible.ai scours a variety of theological interpretations and commentaries to provide you with an instant answer. But that's not all. You have the option of refining your query, requesting clarification, or exploring more verses relevant to your question. HelloBible.ai is your personal Bible assistant, available 24-7 every day of the year. Innovation in the service of tradition. Hundreds of thousands of questions have already been answered on Hello Bible with a remarkable user satisfaction. Throughout history, every innovation has played a key role in the spread and accessibility of the Bible. Hello Bible.ai follows in this tradition with the deep conviction that marrying biblical tradition with technological advances can transform lives and glorify God. So I don't know, I prefer my voice with AI in English. No, don't you think it's a much better accent? Yeah, I love it. Um, so as we were developing a low Bible, we started to face challenges, seven challenges at least. And I would like to go quickly through these uh, challenges. We, we, we are using ChatGPT, we are using Anthropic, we try Llama, we try different LLM. Okay, but one of the issues was, was this one. Uh, numerous sources has, have been scrapped without permission, violating copyrights, including Bible translations. So how you use a LLM if this LLM stole Bibles, for example? That's, that's, that was one of the issues. Uh, source, oh sorry, cit citation. It's a French word, uh, citation. So uh, ChatGPT's failure to explicitly cite its sources, that was also an issue. Information reliability. So ChatGPT's reliability is not guaranteed, it can produce inaccuracies. So one day, I asked this question to uh, ChatGPT. Why? So I'm a global ambassador and advisor for the chosen. So I was interested to know what ChatGPT is saying about the chosen. So I ask a kind of a special question. Why Matthew has fins, fins in the chosen? So what would be your answer? You human. Matthew has no fins. Okay. So first answer was oh, to glorify God. Okay. Uh, I said, I think you make a mistake. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. You know the big sentence in ChatGPT, I apologize. That's true. It's in fact because Matthew is a fisherman, and when he's going to fish, he can swim faster. Wow. I didn't know Matthew was a fisherman. So I asked Dali, to make a picture out of it. This is Matthew in the chosen according to ChatGPT. Cool, but not really accurate. Okay, so we faced this kind of issue and we monitor like thousands, dozens of thousands of questions and answers from people. And we started to see that sometimes it's not so accurate. So we faced another issue. Uh, this is the language processing quality. So sometimes, you know, uh, less common language, the handling of less common language is inadequate. Like in Madagascar, we launched the chosen in Madagascar. We launched a chatbot on Facebook uh, for Madagascar. And I greetings to Darrell here from the chosen. And uh, 
and greetings to you too. And um, so, wonderful, wonderful adventure in Madagascar, but the language in Malagasy language of ChatGPT is really bad, okay? Because the LLM has not been trained with content for, from the country. So that was also an issue. That's an issue, by the way. Next one, potential cost. So I have my, my, my friend Terry Storch from Uversion is there. If they start to use ChatGPT, in fact, in Uversion, who is there? 50 million active users or more. So I guess the cost will be like a million or more every day. So potential costs, even for us, even in France, uh, are quite high. Then we also uh, thought about this issue. Okay, what will happen in Indonesia if OpenAI is giving the data to the government? Okay, in Muslim countries, in close countries, what will happen? Do we trust OpenAI? Do you trust? Oh, you don't have to answer. And then we, we found also that uh, there is a risk. So what will happen if suddenly uh, OpenAI or Anthropic uh, or other one boycott, censor Christian content? So, so we started to think we need a solution and here is something we, we think about. Um, in response to these challenges, we think that we need to develop train, I would say, to train our own uh, large language model, uh, supported by a robust database, a RAG, that emerged as a solution. So we started to work on it, to create, to educate our own LLM, uh, and to create our own corpus database, data set, to train this LLM for Hello Bible. But then I started to think, Eric, it's not smart to do it for yourself. What if you do it for others? What, what if you, you cooperate with others to do it and you make it open source? I'm not used to open source. Uh, I'm used to develop things and, and to protect them, okay? But I think now, what we are facing, all these challenges we are facing, these ethical issues we are facing, uh, we need cooperation. So I would like to invite you, and I know several of you, uh, Scott Beck from Glue or Terry from Uversion and other people in the room, they want to cooperate. And so we want to cooperate to create a tool. You know, sometimes I prefer Airbus than Boeing. Airbus planes, you know? They are less dangerous. Boeing, a little bit dangerous at this time. But in fact, <laughs> but in fact, you know the engine of Airbus or the engine of, of, of Boeing are British. Rolls Royce. And when there is a, a crash of a plane, it's never the engine. Never. Because the engine is really good. So we need to create a good engine together and to make it available for free open source to all the church, to, to the church with a capital C, to the body of Christ. We need to train this LLM with languages, with Bible version, with copyrights, with content, with the, the right to copy, okay? And we need to make it available. I will use it, you will use it on your plane. It can be a French plane, it can be an American plane. We don't care, you just we use it, okay? So, I, I'm calling us for a collaboration. I didn't have much time to explain, so I wrote for us, for you, a white paper about it. So if you go to uh, United Corp Corpus, okay, dot AI, you go to this website, you can contact me. You will have my WhatsApp direct, my email, everything. You can contact me. You can read this white paper, okay? And you can comment in the, into this white paper. You can add your comments. Let's start an open source project together, guys. 
And I don't care if it's coming from France or, or from UK or from the US. We just need it. Okay? We need it. We will all save time, all save money, and a lot of money. And the Bible translation will benefit from it. The education will benefit from it. The pastors and the priests, the church will benefit from it. Evangelization will benefit from it. Discipleship will benefit from it. Okay? So I encourage us. It's why we cross with Benjamin the Ocean, just to share that with you and see what God will do with that. Okay? So I'm very thankful. Now you can start to judge me because I just finish. I'm done. Okay? So I would like you to read this quote from Steve Jobs. Okay? It's an interesting quote. Uh, sorry, I'm not finishing with a Bible verse. <laughs> I agree with you. I, uh, so I, I will not read it because I don't want to offend the memory of Steve Jobs, okay? But the crazy ones, okay, I'm looking at the crazy ones in the room, the misfits, the, how would you say that, rebels? Oh, rebel. Re re Rebels, the troublemakers, oh, so the guys from The Chosen, they love this sentence, troublemakers, okay? The round pegs in the square holes. So if you feel you are one of these guys, contact me, okay? And maybe at the end of the day, in a few months, in a few years, uh, we will see genius, okay? Thank you for your attention. And I'm glad, please welcome Adam and Marcus for an amazing talk. Good morning, everyone. I really like this microphone because it reminds me of MTV. I feel like I'm on Total Request Live, so I'm taking requests. So Marcus and I are going to talk about uh, AI ethics in ministry practice. Um, James Poulter, uh, you know, set us up really well, and he was talking about ethics being the brake on the car. I think it's also a bit of the steering wheel. It's helping us figure out where we're going and how we want to get there. So we want to, uh, this morning, just present uh, a draft of some ethics guidelines for Christian organizations, and our intention is to really start to gather feedback on this draft. This presentation really originated out of our affiliation with uh, AI and Faith. Um, it's a global network of AI Christian experts, um, and we both happen, uh, it, it's based in Seattle, we both happen to live in Chicago. And uh, their vision is really to uh, establish an ethical set of guidelines grounded in our faith. And uh, we've been working a little bit with the ECFA to learn from them, from their accounting standards, what might translate into this context. Uh, we're not really aware of anything uh, like this. Uh, there has been talk about it already this morning. So there are already conversations like this happening, which is fantastic. We know there are lots of secular benchmarks out there. We do know that uh, in the Bible translation space, aqua is a set of principles already being used. And so this is really our attempt to outline some of the fundamental aspects, fundamental values, both at a technical level and at an organizational level. Um, and so these current guidelines are really uh, focused on generative AI and LLMs particularly. So we're not yet talking about other forms of AI, but we do uh, want to have that in mind. Um, and so we do want to expand that broader scope. And if you have ideas what that might look like, we would love to connect more. So our hope for this presentation is really that it'll spark some ideas for you about ethical guidelines, maybe uh, highlight some aspects that you and your organization want to think about more um, as you're considering either adopting AI or deploying AI, um, and to really show you a possible way to begin testing LLMs to ensure that generative AI is aligning with Christian doctrine, with your organization, with Christian principles, 
And so after the conference today, uh, here in the room, uh, AI and Faith is hosting a design sprint for about 90 minutes. And you are invited to join us, beat these up, offer feedback, suggest other guidelines, and uh, we're gonna jump in. So uh, as I said, my name is Adam, and I consult with Christian organizations, helping leaders sort of align their emerging technology to their ministry strategy. And my name is Marcus Schwording. I am a senior editor at AI and Faith, and I am a fourth year PhD candidate at the University of Chicago at studying artificial intelligence. All right, let's jump in and talk about some of these principles. As we see it, there are at least sort of two domains within which we want to develop some guiding principles. There's the technical side, and there's the organizational side. On the technical side, it's really about developing ways to evaluate these AI models, defining ways to measure them. And as Marcus likes to quote Lord Calvin saying, if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. On the organizational side, there are conversations that you need to be having internally. James Poulter already mentioned some of them. But really figuring out what, what questions you need to be answering, what conversations you need to be having as an organization, apart from the AI system itself. Whether you're deploying for AI customers or whether you're adopting them internally. And both of these are vital to the ethical approach to AI. And for the sake of time, we're going to focus primarily on the technical side today. And so I'll quickly outline each one and then hand it over to Marcus to uh, share a benchmarking proof of concept. So first, AI awareness. When users are engaging with your organizations or using a product that you've created, they should be aware that they're using an AI system in some way. When and how they're using it, uh, they should be aware of how that's involved in the interaction. By contrast, when there's this lack of awareness, your users, you're putting your, both yourself and your users at risk. Um, users who don't know that they're using an AI system may trust it more than they should or they may share more or less than uh, they would be comfortable with if they knew. Um, and they may believe that it is an authoritative voice that represents your organization. And likely you need to think about the ways that that perception is going to uh, be influencing their perception of your organization. Second, there's bias. Obviously this is another big one that a lot of you uh, are already talking about. Globally, there are many legally protected classes like sex, race, disability, creed, national origin, and a number of others. And so bias in these areas are going to open you up to legal liability. Uh, Ian Spear yesterday had a great talk on a lot of this. Uh, I really look forward to uh, interacting with him more, learning from him. But ensuring fairness here is really uh, vital. As Christians, we don't simply want to go with this sort of legal minimum. Um, there may be other aspects that we would want to account for, to pursue justice for, that goes above and beyond as Christians. Maybe you have some of these ideas. And I would just jump in at this point to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, quantifying the degree to which these models are uh, portraying stereotypes is now being well quantified, both for generative AIs generating images, but also for text. Um, this is work out of the University of Stanford uh, that's, that's really demonstrating how these stereotypes come about in these models. Third, privacy is another concern that you are well aware of. Um, and this starts both with the data that is being used for training but also uh, what kinds of outputs it's creating. So when it comes to training, the personally identifiable information should be excluded in almost every case. You shouldn't be uh, ingesting personally identifiable information into your training data for any public facing uh, system that is available to consumers. PII should not be used in those training data sets. Um, and in most private facing data sets, uh, that you might be using internally to your organization. Um, you shouldn't be ingesting personal identifiable inf information in most cases. Um, the exceptions should be rare and they should be well justified uh, in that dialogue that you're having internally as an organization. If you're using your personnel's data 
in your training systems internally, you are potentially exposing that data to the entire company. You should also be thinking about how long are you keeping this data? You shouldn't be keeping it forever. That includes both the prompts that they're inputting and the outputs that you're generating. Um, this should also be limiting uh, how you are keeping the prompts and the responses, how that data is linked together, and users should really be aware of how long their data is being retained. Fourth, uh, the environment. So imagine flying between London and New York 600 times. That's how much CO2 was used to train a GPT-3. About 500 metric tons. Now yesterday, Tom Keller said that GPT-4 took 13,000 metric tons of CO2. So I did the math, that's 15,000 flights between New York and LA to train GPT-4. And as, on top of that, prompting GPTs takes anywhere from three to 30 times more energy than a Google search query. And so, and it often leads to follow-up queries. These costs are rarely visible to us, let alone are something that we can really feel. It's easy to ignore and lose sight of this impact that it's having on the environment. And I believe that Christian stewardship absolutely demands that Christians be conscientious, that we go above and beyond sort of these legal limits, that we take responsibility to manage them, and that we go above and beyond. These AI systems uh, that are deploying um, should make these impacts more transparent to the users who are using them. If nothing else, it enables them to make a decision about how they're using this system and not having that decision made for them. And as Christian organizations, we should be asking what the environmental impact of our own usage is in these cases. The fifth principle we'd like to talk about is uh, what I like to call traceability. Um, and this was highlighted by the previous speaker really well, I think. And this is really uh, when an organization has a code base and something goes wrong, they are able to write unit tests. They're able to diagnose what the problem is and address it. Now, if an organization is relying on a third party for a large language model, diagnosing and addressing an issue can be very difficult. So, if you can have a large language model within your organization, it's, a, it's going to be very difficult to address those underlying issues, but it is possible. Whereas with those third parties, it can be very difficult to go back and reconfigure and readdress particular issues that your users may be facing. Finally, uh, benchmarks. So Proverbs 11 says, the Lord detests dishonest scales but accurate weights find favor with him. Throughout the Old Testament, honest weights and measures are, are one of the most repeated commands. And benchmarks can help us establish that our AI systems are using weights and measures that align with a Christian worldview. My friend John Dyer likes to say that a sword can kill a person, but a scale can cheat an entire city into poverty. Without these benchmarks, organizations that use or deploy imbalanced AI systems risk misleading people into impoverished theologies, impoverished Christian lives. And so we need to establish these benchmarks for evaluating the, these AI systems. And for that, I'll turn it over to Marcus. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so I am more on the technical side of things, and so I will be telling you about a proof of concept that I've sort of come up with for benchmarking some of these LLMs in ways that organizations can start using for themselves. Uh, so regardless of the system we're talking about, how do we quantitatively determine whether an LLM aligns with our organization's objectives? I'm proposing that we use a, a type of model called natural language inference to answer the question, does an LLM response, response align with some agreed upon premise? So let's say my premise is God loves the world, and the response from a human or an LLM is, well, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world, etc. In this case, we would say that the response entails the premise. But there are three options for what could be happening here. There could be a contradiction between the premise and the response. 
It could be neutral, as in the response doesn't contain anything pertinent to the premise, or the, the response could entail the premise. Those are our three options here. Now, we're using a, a, an off-the-shelf uh, pre-trained model that you can get from Hugging Face. It's called BART Large MNLI. It is a transformer model. And we're gonna look at specifically three different LLM systems that you all have, ac uh, you all have access to. Um, there's ChatGPT without a prompt. There is ChatGPT with some quote unquote prompt engineering. The LLM is essentially told, you are a Christian scholar. You are answering questions according to Christian orthodoxy. And then we are looking at a Jesus chatbot using RAG. There has been a lot of retrieval augment, uh, re retrieval augmented generation at this conference today. So we're gonna look at how that system performs as well. And then I'm going to start with my premise and I'm going to surround that premise with a prompt that I'm going to give to a large language model. It's going to say true or false, insert your premise like God loves the world, and defend only one perspective. Now we're going to use natural language inference, this pre-trained model, to assess the probability of entailment neutrality, or a contradiction between the premise and the response. And here are several examples. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, whether or not these large language models can restate doctrines from the Nicene Creed. So we see up uh, on the left here, the statement, God is the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Now on the far left, you see that there is a very low probability of any of these models contradicting this statement. Now this is already kind of interesting. You might expect that ChatGPT straight out of the box wouldn't agree with this statement, but it turns out that the probability is practically 100% entailment across all three. ChatGPT without a prompt, ChatGPT with a prompt, what we would call zero shot, and then the Jesus chatbot. It's essentially the same for the statement there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. Again, we see very low probabilities of contradiction, and we see very high probabilities of entailment. Essentially, all three of our models agree with this statement. That's essentially the same case with the third one. However, um, there, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and has spoken through the prophets. This is essentially two premises that the model has to support at once and is being assessed independently, or is being assessed together, excuse me, instead of independently. And so we get some more conflation here between contradiction and entailment on this particular, particular statement. Now, let's turn to something a little more uh, perhaps sensitive or divisive amongst uh, the Christian world, amongst, amongst various organizations. So this statement here, sexual activity is always open to the possibility of life if you talk to a Catholic they would likely affirm this. And what you see here is essentially a bimodal type of response. You see that there are responses from all three models that would say, yes, absolutely, and here's an argument, and no, absolutely not, here's an equally strong argument. And then there's essentially no area for neutrality with this first statement either. On the second one, the statement, homosexuality is immoral. You find that ChatGPT, without any pre-prompting, will say that is a contradiction. However, if you look at either ChatGPT with this zero shot or your RAG system, there is a large probability that it won't take one stance or the other. And this is really important. If you have a RAG system here and you think that your corpus is enough to defend your organization's perspectives, you should be testing it. And here's sort of a summary of all of these statements that we've looked at. And um, what I'd like to end with before I turn it back over to Adam is that natural language inference can be a flexible approach across a lot of different large language models to assess whether or not particular premises are actually, um, are actually being used and responded to correctly by a large language model. Thanks, Marcus. All right, to sum up, there are, these are some of the principles that we believe ministries need to be thinking about 
There may be others. You might have them in mind. We would love to talk more about them. Um, wherever AI is showing up, these principles also need to be showing up. We need a way to drive the car. This also means that we need to find ways to operationalize these principles at a technical level in ways that Marcus has shown. Finally, let's briefly talk about where we hope this tool and these ethical principles might go. Where do we go from here? We're beginning to think about what a roadmap might look like to develop these standards. First, drafting guidelines. This is, just a, this is the stage that we're at at the moment. We're just starting out. This will involve conversation, collaboration, much like we've talked about this week. Second, building an auditing framework. We want to build on these guidelines and find ways that we can uh, learn from groups like the ECFA for best practices here. Third, we want to develop testing tools like Marcus has shown. We're working on some of these technical processes. Further down the road, there's internal auditing, external auditing, certification, accountability. We want to enable you to do and evaluate your AI systems to self-diagnose misalignment. We want to be able to allow you to outsource some of this work so you can focus on your core mission and vision. We want to give you a degree of authority and trust with your constituents. And we want to give you and your constituents the confidence about the AI models that you're using. Basically, as the icons show, you get a lot of check marks. Wow, that died. Nobody got it. That's all right. You told me you did. We know that you care about ethical use of AI. Uh, our goal is to really help you and your organization have a place to start. Um, and we want to help you protect your reputation as a ministry and give you a path that makes sense. As we said, we're very much at a draft stage. We welcome your input. And AI and Faith, like I said, is hosting a 90-minute design sprint here at 3.30. You are invited, uh, please join us. Um, and we are looking for ministries and AI builders who care about these principles and want to both shape these principles but also implement them in their organizations. So thank you. Please join me in welcoming Gregory Richardson, the ethical hacker. afternoon-ish all. Um, this is not just for Ryder, but Ryder knows he started this. So before I start, um, no, 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 Ryder started it today. But anyway, um, this is my fifth generation Android phone, which means in probably about four or five years, Y'all will have an Apple phone that can do that. <laughs> and it, it'll be absolutely secure. And if that's not sufficient, um, Ryder was ranting on about, um, sorry, people were ranting on about Windows machines can't run AI models. This has a built-in MPU made by Intel. And I probably expect it'll be maybe a six or seven year period before you have an Apple computer that can do this. I rest my case. Enough of the free commercial for um, <laughs> Wintel platform. My name is Gregory. Um, I have very limited time, so let's jump in. JP said earlier, uh, and I'm going to co-opt his statement because I agree with it very, very strongly. We are the last generation that will remember, oops, yeah, thank you. We are the last generation that will remember what it was like before the AI or the robots came to help. Remember that, please. That is unequivocally true. 
And I believe this room particularly has a very, very strong and urgent requirement to be involved in this process. I know there are other rooms, you know, that, you know in other places where these conversations are happening, um, but I suggest that we have major problems we need to solve quickly from a church and faith-based organization perspective. So to kind of lay out my, 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 the framework that I'm gonna lay out, uh, so that's the strategic approach for how we can do this, I'm gonna break it down into a couple of four tactical chunks of things you know, that we can approach. I'll break down the, the, the problem statement very quickly and then I'll get into you know, the, the actual things I think we should be doing and what we should be focused on. At a high level, I'll do as um, Dr. K did yesterday and hopefully I get the term right. Um, here's the bluff, um, right. So at a high level, what I'm suggesting is we do quick execution and we do effective collaboration. There are already, like I've literally been taking notes this, the, the entire yesterday and all of this morning, there are already multiple organizations and people represented here in this room today where we are working on exactly the same two things. I'll give you two examples. Well, one is a direct example, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, I'm just saying collaboration is something people of most of the, the, the the personality types that are in this room are not intuitively very good at, so I'm suggesting lean into the collaboration gene a little bit more and maybe lean away from the you know, tech genius guru type gene. Uh, I'm a tech genius guru, whatever you want to call it as well. That's all I've done my entire life. So I, I'm, I'm speaking here with a lot of love, but I'm also speaking to myself when I say I would much rather be in my hotel room after the event is done and not go to dinner with anyone and sit in my shower in the fetal position with water running over me because I've been around people all day. And I'm not, that's not a hygiene thing. That's a, it's, it's not my thing, it's not my jam. I'm comfortable speaking here, not necessarily comfortable out in the lobby, you know, fellowshipping and hanging out. It's just not my jam and it's probably not many of your jam. But we're going to need to figure out how to be better at that if we're going to break down some of these collaborative things. So I promised two examples. Example number one, last week, um, I have very limited time, so don't clap. No. <laughs> last week, last week, sorry, last year at Missional, uh, and thanks to um, mentor professors and other people who last year very sporadically said, Greg, you need to come to Missional. I was like, what's Missional? Just shut up and go, it's for you. And I went, and it was absolutely life-changing. I walked in the door and I started texting my wife, oh my God, these are my people. Like literally, this, this is my tribe right here. I've been looking for this my entire life. Um, so at Missional, um, I, I heard a talker, a speaker, his name was Thomas Osborne, and he very casually spoke about discipleship and using AI to power discipleship. Since then, Thomas and I, with a group of other people, Yvonne and Mike Miser and several other people, have been working on standing up uh, AI-powered discipleship algorithm for doing discipleship matching, because we saw that as an urgent need. So that is a real-world collaborative thing that came out of Missional last year, full stop. It, it, we're now ship, shopping it to, to, to <laughs> we're now shopping it to Dallas Theological Seminary and many other places. Um, it's still in beta, we're still working out, you know, architecture and some other details, but it is a result of collaboration that came out of this room. We need more of that. The little cute silos of I'm super smart and I'm gonna figure this out on my own, it works, it doesn't scale though. And we need scale to solve the problems I'm about to, to describe. The next thing, uh, I, next example I promised, um, myself sitting here um, was inspired, literally, last year. And I was like, oh my God, some of these ideas that I have bubbling around, I probably need to do something with them. So on the back of that, I literally took a week off and I went and I developed a SaaS app that had been bubbling around in my head. It's called ActScribe. It's for simple usage of AI for trans transcribing. Um, um, in my case, the use case was transcribing sermon notes because I go to church and as a good nerd, I go to church with my laptop and I'm sitting there taking notes and it was pretty quick before I realized this doesn't, it's not efficient. 
So, you know, it breaks down the notes, um, gives me discussion questions for my small group that I lead, you know, with men on Wednesday nights. And it does all of that based on the sermon that the pastor just gave. So I, I developed that. It took a week, but I'm saying execute and execute quickly. I could have, and my inclination was to sit on that idea and perfect it. You know, I, I got to have exactly the right UI, and I got to have exactly the right logo, and I got to come up with exactly the right name, and something, somewhere, I'm going to blame it on the Holy Spirit, kind of motivated, motivated me and said, just release it already. Just release it already. It doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be out there. And the gift that I got from releasing it at what was probably an MVP version was I got feedback from my, my audience. Net net is today, official release was in January. We have a 2,500% plus, closer to 3,000% plus growth in MRR today from January to today. Just because I got the feedback, customers said we'd like this and this and this. We implemented this and this and this. We're now on our third iteration and the market is lapping it up. They love it, it's super useful. I have teachers and podcasters saying, oh my God, I, I have all of this content. I wanted to use it for you know, making study guides, et cetera. Your tool helps me do that. Great, glad to help. Not what I designed it for, but that's what the market is using it for. So again, collaborate, stop sitting on it and execute. Why? We got two fundamental problem statements and they interact with each other. Problem number one, and the slides are absolutely gonna be available, they're already shared, you'll get them. I'll also share um, notes from you know, the talk itself. Um, but either way, the footnote is on the slide so you can get the rest of the data. This comes from Barna and Glue's um, um, analysis. JP actually referenced this as well. Um, Christians disproportionately fair AI compared to other demographics. That is a huge problem. Christians don't trust AI. Christians don't want their church to use AI. Christians would be disappointed if they found out their churches were using AI. Now, I work in cybersecurity. That's my day job. And in cybersecurity, you don't find that. In corporate America, they are excited to jump all over AI. Maybe five, six, seven years ago, before the, 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 the existence of ChatGPT, Corporate America was all over. If you went to the big conferences, the RSAs, the Black Hats, the DEF CONs, everyone was talking AI. AI was the buzzword of the week because everyone wanted to say, we're going to solve every problem with AI. While we're out here being intimidated of it, and I, 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 look, I go to a, a church in a very progressive area, upper middle class people predominantly, um, you know, routine to see Tesla trucks in my church parking lot in Texas. Like it's not an unusual thing at all. And it's kind of a mega church-esque vibe. So probably 14,000 people show up, um, you know, over all the services on a weekend. I'm saying, you know, these are upwardly mobile people, doctors, PhD, lawyers, etc. I had several of them come to me after service two, three weeks ago, said, listen, uh, I believe this, this AI thing you're working on is demon possessed. I'm not exaggerating, like that, that's, that's not hyperbole and it's not a joke. I had to sit the person down and explain to him, listen, let's have a conversation. And I had to start dispelling that myth that the tech could be potentially demon possessed to explain them the value that we can get out of it. It is our job to dispel those myths amongst other things. But why? What makes this problem that Christians disproportionately fear AI, what makes that even more problematic? What makes it even more problematic is this, this statistic here. The generation that is most at risk of leaving the church and wanting nothing to do with faith-based faith initiatives, that generation is using AI more than anyone else. They have a propensity to want to use it, in, and I have a 16-year and a 15-year-old daughter, and they app, like their school tells them, use AI to generate this essay that I'm having you write, and your test is going to be defended. The test is no longer show up with a two-page essay. The test is, we know you generated it with AI. We're going to do an oral defense of it for you. And I love that approach. So they are super comfortable working with AI while we're out here on the outskirts saying it's evil and it might be demon-possessed, which is why we have to, in this room, 
needs to urgently engage with the faith-based organizations. You need to urgently volunteer your time. A lot of it is going to be for free. To give less lectures, to speak to Sunday schools, to, to talk to church leaders. And in my experience, the church leaders are excited to do that. They, if given the opportunity, churches, big, small, low resource, all of them are excited to engage with this technology. What I'm suggesting, and this is kind of in wrap up because I'm going to try to be super respectful of time. Um, the Apostle Paul, and everyone's been quoting scripture, so this isn't something I usually get to do. I'm going to lean into the scripture here for a hot second. Again, this is my tribe. I feel very comfortable. I wish I could do this more often. Um, the Apostle Paul described himself as a master builder. I suggest to you, uh, take a step back, that master builder qualification, that gifting he had, suggesting to you it was probably tied to the apostolic. Paul described in 1 Corinthians, I am a master builder because I am building the foundation for someone else to build on top of it. That's what a master builder does. I must suggest to you, that's what the apostolic gifting probably enabled Paul to do. I believe it was a spiritual gifting that triggered that ability in Paul to see the big picture at such a high level that the same thing that Dr. K spoke about yesterday, that from Genesis to, to Acts, there are breadcrumbs, bread trails of, hey, the outreach is going to be to the ends of the world. It's going to be the other nations. So why do you think Paul was constantly harping on, I got to get to Spain, I got to get to Spain? It wasn't for paella. That was the, 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 the constraints of what they understood to be the known world. So he was executing on the grand picture of it's not just about right here. We got to spread this message throughout everywhere. Paul saw the big picture and was able to break the, and this is the key right here. Paul was able to see the big picture and through the apostolic gifting, break that into small digestible chunks that other people could execute on. Welcome to your task. Take this complex, convoluted, technical world that we live in, where we love to do an acronym a minute, and break it up into digestible chunks like an architect would do, and allow the electrician to do just what the electrician needs to do. Look, we don't know where the drywall, we know where the drywall is going to go, but it's not there yet. So in lieu of the drywall being there, me, the architect, I'm going to tell you, this pipe needs to come right here. Can't be an inch to the left, can't be an inch to the right. Why? Trust me, because I know after you're done, something else is coming that's going to block around it, so you got to be exactly right there. That's our job as technologists. I'm going to close on this slide. I very purposely kept my slides low in case the clicker acted the fool, and it didn't, so yeah. Um, another, not really Steve Jobs quote, but this comes from fund funders and founders. Um, who are the hackers? I believe very firmly many of us here probably identify as hackers. I definitely do. I have my, uh, pretty much my entire adult life and probably starting at, and this is in the 70s, mind you, starting at somewhere around 1970, 89, 70, 80, somewhere thereabouts. Um, I saw an ad during the electric company in Sesame Street. I was 9 or 10 years old and I saw an ad for the VIC-20 computer. And I don't know what it was. But I told my mom and dad, that's it. I have to do that. What is it? I don't know yet. But I know this is in me. I got to do it. And the, the journey started from there. Many of us have that. What I want you to notice on this graph is there's two forms of hackers. There's two personality traits that come to the forefront and are probably sitting in many of your back pockets right now. One is the, I have technical skill and ability and I want to go and do it. Stereotypical textbook hacker. But the other hacker is that I have no technical skill and ability, but I see the big picture. I want to go do it. Collaborate together. Both of those ca character traits and personalities are valuable for the urgent mission we have at hand to execute. Both of them are required. So my, my, my challenge to everyone in the room is find those opportunities. 
Many of them may not be profitable. When I started in cybersecurity 37 years ago, the worst possible job you could possibly want. No one cared. I'd go to, hey, I'm, do cybersecurity. Cyber, why? What, what are you protecting me from? Remember, this was pre-internet. My accountant? I don't need protection from my accountant who's on the same network with me. If he wants to steal money from me, he'll take the checkbook, which he already has. Like, there was literally, but I stuck with it, much to the chagrin of my father, who was like, you're a smart kid, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. Like, we had real heated conversations. I'd like to say that, you know, I was brilliant, so I saw that this was going to be the nonsense. I was stubborn. I liked it. Felt like it was in me. I did what I wanted to do because I was passionate about this. 15, 20 years later, after being broke and being an admin ex ex exchange administrator and a Novell network admin administrator to pay the bills, suddenly cybersecurity took off. And then finally I was like, oh, I understand God. All the time asking God, you need me to quit this and go and be a pastor or a preacher or something like that? Nope. Shut up, Greg. Stay where you're at. I have a purpose. Many of us here have that purpose. Collaborate together, let's execute together, and let's be what God has purposed for us to be. My contact information is up there. Um, I got two minutes left, so I'm going to be graceful and give that two minutes to the next speaker, who probably is going to come up here with Apple computers and they'll need as much help as they can get. Thank you. I know you guys are hungry. We're almost finished. Greg, I really, or Gregory, really appreciate your presentation. I'm sorry that you're not in the giant group iMessage that the rest of us are in. But don't worry, we'll still collaborate with you, even though you don't get to participate in our FaceTimes and airdropping of documents and data. Anyway, I'm going to switch over to signing now. Hello, everyone. If we've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Kristen. Hello. I want to also welcome our audience online. For those of you who are here, we've not yet had a chance to meet. I've come to the Missional AI Conference before. I may look a little different if you've <laughs> seen me now this year than I was in the previous years. I am pregnant with twins this year. <laughs> I understand the response, so after I present today, I will be accepting donations for uh, the Twins' College Fund. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so today, I am joined by our panels of panelists of experts who have been working in the sign language translation space. And so I want to talk about how AI can impact sign language translation for the Bible. All right, we are starting with Kayo. He's the production manager for the sign language translation tool. Oh, okay, I'll stay seated. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to go up. All right. Kayo, how do you envision AI impacting the sign language translation tool for translating the Bible into different sign languages? Sure, thank you so much for the question. So just so you know, when we talk about the sign language translation tool, there's a sign for it that we use, also abbreviated as SLTT. 
So when we talk about translating the scriptures into various sign languages around the world, you know, we'll also leverage the use of consultants for their checks or other uh, members of the team that will do checks. Uh, right now, I think we have about 60 different translation teams worldwide using SLTT on some level. And so it can take upwards of about two weeks to get a project started with the SLTT. With that said, I think we have, and maybe we can show the graphic behind us, uh, and if not, we can show it later. Uh, but I have a couple of different points I want to go ahead and just share with each and every one of you uh, to kind of give you an opportunity to see you know, how we can work together, how we can collaborate. That's been the name of the game thus far, right? And so with that, for sign language, uh, obviously it's going to be in video format. It's a visual modality uh, for the way that deaf people are going to receive God's word. And so with that, uh, we have several different key features where uh, I want to talk about today. First one is a keyword sign finder. Uh, this feature searches for keywords corresponding to signs, yielding a list of portions, passages, and time codes uh, for analysis and use by translators and consultants. It has a potential to reduce the time up to 35%, effectively decreasing the duration of an eight-year project down to five years. Next up, we have the background removal and caption enhancement automation. And so we have the ability uh, to go ahead and facilitate better comprehension uh, for our deaf blind individuals. And this function will automate the removal, of the removal for video backgrounds and adjusting caption contrast and enhancing lighting to increase the quality. Um, and certain nuances may need adjustments uh, for the specific audience. And these automated adjustments will help in the drafting of translations. Uh, next up, I want to talk about video patch smoothing. And so often what can happen is that video patches are used uh, to correct errors or to make improvements. And uh, what ends up happening is that uh, it can lead to like a patchwork type of appearance when you watch the video. So either the drafting teams or the consultants, and they spend an inordinate amount of time making fixes, making corrections. And so with that, because of the amount of effort the, analysis, the analysts and consultants are needed to use in order to have the video function properly, uh, this, we are expecting and hoping uh, that AI will allow for the ability to smooth out these patches, uh, to make the videos appear seamless. And we're hoping that this technology could potentially reduce the time spent on these kinds of tasks by upwards of 50%. Uh, additionally, uh, we think AI could have profound implications with regards to sign occurrence rate based on biblical keywords. You know, this feature can generate a rate of sign occurrences aligned with key biblical terms within verses. If the rate is low, an analyst or consultant can review to confirm discrepancies or verify that a combination of signs and their variations with regards to expressions, tones, non-manual markers, mouth morphemes, etc., in order to sufficiently match the key term crucial for the translation. And these are just a few of the ideas uh, that we've been considering. There's so much more that I'm sure uh, God has in store for all of us with regards to AI's ability to enhance the SLTT. We know that things have been prepared for such a time as this, and we have uh, when it comes to sign language translation, we have uh, the Chronological Bible Translation, the CBT. We have the American Sign Language Version, the ASLV. And we are hoping, by his grace, we will be able to leverage this technology to expedite any and all processes within sign language Bible translation. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And now we have Joel from the Deaf Bible Society. He's the chief technical officer. So Joel, how do you utilize AI within Deaf Bible Society? And how do you envision AI benefiting the work of Bible translation moving forward? Thanks, Kristen, for asking. At Deaf Bible Society, we are using AI technologies uh, similar with what Dal had talked about this morning, where he talked about the story of the talents and how they were given each for based on their ability. But the parable of the talents is really 
to focus on what we have and not on what we don't have. So in Deaf Bible Society, we know if we've been given two talents, that we have to figure out how to manage well those two talents and do the best that we can with what we are given. And so we have been using AI technology to be able to focus on our business areas so we're not wasting administrative time. So we're trying to find opportunities where we, uh, opportunities where we can utilize AI to reduce the time that it takes for us to do administrative work so that we can reallocate our time to use for more networking and connecting with our high value task. So if it's taking 47 hours for this group of people to do this certain sort of administrative activity, but now we're able to implement AI to reduce that amount of time into seven hours. And so that then in a year, we're able to save 400 hours of administrative time to 500 hours even, four to 500 hours, then we're able to give back to our deaf community to serve them better. So we're utilizing AI technology to find places where we're wasting too much time in an administrative task where we could reallocate that time to a high value task. So we imagine the future of AI in our in Deaf Bible Society and things that we're, we're talking about. We're par talking about partnering with the sign language translation tool, with Wycliffe and many other agencies and organiz organizations who are using AI technology to develop a dictionary of sign language words, vocabulary, and in many other ways. We definitely see where there is an opportunity for AI to be used in the sign language space. Thank you, Jewel. <laughs> okay. Next, we have Aiden, who is from Global Partnerships and Wycliffe. He is the sign language partnership specialist. So Aiden, you have been working with the Chameleon Sign Language Avatar Project. What potential impacts could AI have on sign language Bible translation in the future and avatar development. Thank you, thank you, Kristen, so much for that question. With regards to the Chameleon Project, we have these 3D avatars and we're able to leverage motion capturing and being able to take advantage of artificial intelligence for this markerless system. And we use anywhere from seven to eight cameras uh, that are set up. And I'll give you an example. So we have this five hand shape. We have a camera uh, that's facing towards the interior of the palm, but it can't see the back of the hand. So we need another camera behind the hand and we are able to com communicate and program the AI to recognize, share information in order to render and develop a 3D model of the hand shape. Just an example. And so uh, from that, we have people who've tried to uh, use gloves, thinking that actually will help this markerless motion capture system. Uh, but it doesn't. But this technology are able to, again, using the complexities and the power of AI to find uh, the different micro movements of eyebrows and, and nose uh, movements and ears and all these different facial expressions that make up the semantics and grammar within sign languages in order to render the most accurate message possible. I've had people ask me, so do you think the ASLV can have the full Bible ready and be able to convert it into uh, a 3D model? The answer is, well, the technology is not quite ready yet, but we are communicating and thinking through how AI, how we can leverage those tools to make that 2D Bible translation of the ASLV into a 3D model rendering. And so with that, we we're able to use, uh, the goal is to be able to use that as a 3D model and be able to use it as perhaps a reference source later. Having a 2D model, being able to make a 3D model out of 2D being able to do that would be a massive hurdle to clear, uh, and it requires a ton of data in order to make that possible. But we're on the right track. Uh, we do have software that helps us uh, make the plans and able to do that. There's four points of use I'd like to touch on briefly. In terms of real world application, you know, we want to protect God's sacred word. And if a person is in sin and they're the and if a, if a person is engaged in moral failure, uh, we don't want them to be the person on the face, who uh, on camera, that's signing God's word. And so we have the ability to uh, swap them out for somebody else. 
um, or in very highly sensitive areas, you know, if they're on camera, they could be killed for their faith. And so be able to protect people's identity in order to keep them safe. Uh, another example, when we have, um, you know, situations where a person on camera might not fit, uh, maybe a person with a uh, darker complexion might be more appropriate fit. And so it's, that's going to have profound implications with regards to scripture um, uh, engagement in certain regions. So we're, we're mindful of that as well. Uh, and how to use uh, this tool, we're really excited about drafting and the implications for that. And as Kayo talked about with the sign language translation tool, if there's a mistake, what's happened in the past, you'd have to go all the way back to beginning and start recording all over again. With this drafting tool, leveraging Chameleon, you can pick out the specific handshake that's an incorrect sign. You can pinpoint it very precisely, edit, take that out, and then with a 3D skeleton, put that back in and save a ton of time in the drafting process instead of redoing it start to finish each and every time a small mistake is found. And so being able to do that has unbelievable implications for the efficacy of our time horizon with regards to the drafting process, being able to get to publishing that much faster. Uh, when we realize that there might be a, a sign of a particular biblical concept uh, that might be misunderstood or maybe not used as commonly in this particular region, we can make these quick tweaks. And I'll give you an example. I was a translator myself with the ASLV back 12 years ago, and someone had called me and said, we realized that the way you signed that 12 years ago, we might need to change that. And I tell you what, I gained about 20, 30 pounds since I did that 12 years ago. <laughs> I put on some dad weight now to go back and have to edit me, and you'll see it all of a sudden. You're like, skinny, skinny. Oh, that's a chunk you're eating, skinny, skinny again in, in the video timeline. So, yeah, so this is one of those things we're looking to uh, make improvements on. But how we can use AI is really going to have such, and you can save embarrassing moments like I just described. So, yes, yeah, very excited about what's possible. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Last, we have Jenny Story. She is from the organization Avoda, and she is the sign language program lead. So, Jenny, what AI applications do you see outside of Bible translation that would, in fact, be helpful to the process? Okay, so I'm checking my time first to make sure I have enough time. Uh, we've been, I've been working with Avoda, and we've been developing sign language uh, identification tools. And so we've had a lot of failure <laughs> in the, the space with experimenting. And this whole process, though, has been growing. And it is getting better. So last year, uh, sign language recognition technology has been being developed. And here at Avoda, um, we've been trying to make it possible for AI to assess either a person in person signing or a video of a person signing. So being able to recognize those signs and label it in a production and be able to identify specific signs. And then, tr uh, then that would then send a trigger for it to have the an action. And so then last year, uh, we actually had a big media company who reached out to us and had heard about what we were working on and developing and things of that nature. And they actually asked us if we could demonstrate and have a proof of concept of 30 commands that's given to a television. Similar, like you guys use voice technology, Siri or Alexa or whatever. Even on your TVs, you may use that. Uh, you may say to your TV, I would like to watch the Dallas Cowboys football game. <laughs> and it pops up the Cowboys football game. I mean, I'm sure after last season, Kristen, you're done with them though, right? No more, no more Dallas Cowboys over there, Kristen. But anyway, that similar idea with that voice command, instead a person would be able to sign that in American Sign Language and so that they could, it would recognize it on the television and be able to respond to it actively. So we've collected a video, we've collected the data and been able to train an AI as a model. And so we actually were successful at demonstrating live uh, where a person could sign to their TV uh, and how our P API could integrate with their chat bot, where their set box. And so they have that there on their TV that's connected and then we had three things that we could do. 
I could sign to it, turn on channel 39, and it would change the channel to channel 39. I could even spell out a name of a movie that I wanted to watch. If I wanted to watch Star Wars, I could pull up the Star Wars movie by signing to it. Another things that we could do was say, uh, I want to watch a romantic comedy, and it would pull up romantic comedy options. So it was really cool to be able to demonstrate the ability that AI has in uh, sign language. So the application to Bible translation is significant. And we've been talking with many people, deaf leaders in the community, uh, the sign language translation tool community, trying to figure out how this sign language recognition technology could be applied and utilized in these spaces. And so Kayo had mentioned briefly is being able to search by sign. And that ability is right now is so time consuming because they have to go back and watch the entire video to be able to get one particular sign. And even being able to quantify how many times that sign is used is very difficult. They're having to watch the entire section of, of a video basically an entire passage of scripture in order to be able to, to gather that information. And even a potential hand shape, which is a part of the language, is the hand shapes. And so identifying different hand shapes would be hugely significant to accelerating the translation process, as well as developing a dictionary for our consultants. If our consultants are watching a passage of scripture and they don't recognize a particular sign, they're able then to take that sign, export it, then submit it into some sort of dictionary to search for that particular sign to make sure that that actually is an accurate representation of the concept that's being provided. And so these are some options that we would like to be able to have as being able to label and identify signs. And so these are some of the topics that we've been talking about in the sign language translation space. But like Kayo talked about, there are so many ways that AI could be um, applied to sign language translation for the Bible. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. If you have not seen a sign language Bible translation before, I suggest that you come over to our tables over here and we can pull up an example for you to watch. And if you're curious about learning more about sign language technology or if you have any ideas that you want to come forward with, I, hard, I highly encourage you to stop by our table and talk with us about our deaf leaders in the field bring forward your ideas and we'll talk about what's possible and how we can collaborate together. We have these two links up here. They discuss the ethics of using AI within sign language translation. This is a topic that our community is continuing to discuss about how we can ethically use AI in our work. So I highly recommend that you check these out and see what people have been discussing. Thank you so much for your time. I know you are hungry. <laughs> I hope that you have a wonderful lunch and welcome Daniel back to the stage. Hello. All right, that was awesome. Um, let's give another hand for our morning speakers. So, um, you know, I have to enter my own, my own series of interjections now because uh, I'm in the 1% of this audience that um, really has a disdain for anything Microsoft. Um, <laughs> but I'm not cool enough to use Mac, so you know, with Rider, I'm a, I'm a Linux user, and uh, in the 1% that knows uh, Arch, so basically, my life is painful, but I'm proud that my life is painful. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, lunch is gonna be served uh, the same way as yesterday. If you weren't here and you didn't kind of catch on to that, um, they're actually going to serve you at your tables, so uh, find a table, 
Don't sit in the sort of edges of things. Find a table. They'll bring food to you. Um, if you've registered for gluten-free lunch, um, you can gather your lunch at the registration desk out there. So that, that is one change. Um, if you didn't register for gluten-free but would like gluten-free, um, basically we'll see how much is left over. Um, I'm assuming some people registered for gluten-free and um, they really, really, uh, uh, that, that's a, a, a medical um, thing, so make sure that there's enough for them. If, if you have that just as a preference, um, we can see how much is left over. Um, we're gonna aim for 45 minutes for lunch and uh, come back here. Uh, the, the voice of the heavens will welcome us back.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting our session in five minutes time. Thank you.
What's up, everyone? Come back in. Join the party. Grab a table. Give, give really mean looks to everyone in the, in the foyer until they, until they make their way in. All right, uh, welcome everybody back. Um, as, as everybody finds their spot again, we're going to do um, another Slido poll. So um, if we can go ahead and get the next question up, we'll learn more about each other. Was, was food good for everybody? Can we give, give a hand for the organizers for feeding us well? All right, here's, uh, here's our question. Um, on a scale from one to five, what is your energy level today? Um, let's say right now, after lunch, after your sandwich, how are you feeling? One is low energy, five is high energy. All right, we've got 7% of people just about to drop down. Okay, less. All right, middle of the road, that's the safe answer. Um, well, the 12% of people that are, that are super high energy, um, um, go ahead and infuse that across the whole room. Let's do, uh, let's do one more, one more question maybe. All right, in one word, what is the future of AI for your ministry? Oh, that's a really tough one. Um, if you're struggling with the answer to this, you can just go to a website. It's called chat.openai.com and just ask it to give you the answer. The future. All right, that's, that's got to be the best one. <laughs> All right, huge. Everything's huge. This is the greatest ever. The biggest. Effective. Nice. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, uh, we're going to move into our next series of talks now. Um, I mentioned yesterday this sort of collaboration um, that we need to really be, um, uh, really be going into intentionally between uh, ministry orgs across the lines of academia and industry. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that we have our next speaker, Spence Green from Lilt with us. Um, he, he is uh, doing amazing things in uh, translation um, with a platform, uh, Lilt, that is, is AI-driven uh, translation across multiple industries, but he's, he's, really, um, he, he's really partnered well with the community here and many of the organizations I know represented in the room. So he brings a really great perspective, years of experience. So let's give Spence a, a round of applause. Thank you very much, Daniel. Good to see you all again. I think I was here last year, and there's twice as many of you here as there were last year, which is great to see. Um, I'm going to endeavor to get us back on track and give a talk in about three minutes and see if I can catch up on the schedule. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our uh, platform and the work that we've done with some of you here. Uh, so my name is Spence Green. I'm the CEO. Um, and our, our business uh, is, uh, we serve all kinds of different industries with, they're doing global content. And we started working in this community about four years ago with the Bible Project during COVID actually, when they were ramping up their digital evangelism. And it's kind of spread from there. But we work with large companies like Intel and Bloomberg and uh, with government agencies like the National Weather Service. And what's really cool is that the technology applies across lots of different domains. and. So I think you get the, you know, in working with us, you get the benefit of a commercially proven technology that's got lots of R&D in it uh, from private sector customers. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk in three parts. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some new stuff with uh, our company and how it works. I'll talk a little bit about some of our work here, and then I'll give a little bit of a future-facing view for I think what's coming next. Um, so like I said, uh, I think the reason that people like working with us is uh, we're founded and led by researchers. Both my co-founder and I met working on Google Translate a number of years ago. 
And we started the company because Google didn't use Google Translate for any enterprise applications, and we thought we should fix that problem. Um, and so we've been building these AI solutions for a very, very long time. We build all of the technology that we use, so uh, our platform is built from the ground up, from the models all the way through the software, and then we have linguists as well. We think that an all-in-one complete solution is better than a piecemeal solution for outcomes like quality. Um, and then for some of our customers, and this has actually become a thing in the past year, organizations, uh, maybe not this community, but a lot of organizations are starting to care a lot about where their data and models are. So uh, we give you complete end-to-end -end control over um, all of your uh, organizational information. Okay, so uh, our, I mentioned that our solution is uh, complete and end-to-end, -end, and so it has four parts. It has the platform itself, which you can think of as a model building platform. It's got a lot of tooling to be able to uh, help you build fine-tuned models for very specific use cases. Um, we have a generation uh, function as well now, which we didn't have last year, where you can generate new content in other languages. Uh, we have a very robust set of connectors, so all of the customers we work with, uh, we connect directly into their enterprise systems. There's no like emailing back and forth. And then finally, we have a great team uh, that many of you have worked with uh, to help you scale and build these workflows. Okay, so when, I, when we think about enterprise content, we break it down into three different buckets. And the first bucket uh, that we think about is verified content. And so I mentioned that ours is an end-to-end -end AI platform. Many of our customers, including those here in this audience, have various requirements for the output of the AI models. And those could be factuality requirements, they could be brand requirements, they could be regulatory requirements. And so we have both tooling and we can augment with human linguists uh, to give you like a quality guarantee on the translations that are created or transcreation, so this is more creative content. And that uh, verification process is also what drives model fine tuning. So you can also think of it as data collection. And we have some customers that just use the verified function effect effectively as data labeling to create uh, custom models. Once you've got those custom models, you can use them for what we call instant translation, which is uh, what you think it is. There's no human looking at it. There's no quality guarantee on the output. And uh, so we have a set of applications and APIs that you can then access the custom models that were trained by people uh, that you can use for different applications. And then the thing that we've added, which we're really excited about, is content creation, which I'll talk about a little bit, which is uh, now that you have these fine-tuned models and you have a bunch of in-domain data, you can use a large language model to generate new content. And this tends to cut down new content creation by about 90%. So instead of waiting for like a translation process, you can generate a new uh, blog post, let's say. We have a lot of people using it for support and training documentation right now. And uh, what we're really excited about is like curriculum development. So when you have a bunch of enterprise information and you wanna generate a new article that will help somebody understand how to do something, you may not have the same quality standards for that. And it can be challenging for people to sit there with a blinking cursor. And if you can overcome the blinking cursor and just generate something new, that really accelerates content creation. So this is all, all built together in the same platform. And the way that we have always built these workflows, on the left is the way that people have traditionally used any type of AI model, whether it's a machine translation system or you know, even the early days of like GPT-1 or GPT-2. You, uh, you would generate something and then you would send it to somebody and have them correct it and that would basically be it. And there was no feedback loop to go back in and do training. So our approach has always been, first of all, to cut out any sort of manual data transfer and build workflows directly between systems, people, models, and data. And so when we work with customers, we integrate directly into their systems, um, we pull the content out, it goes through an AI model, there's an iterative process whereby if it's a verified approach, a linguist will correct the output, that goes into a model builder to do uh, fine tuning, We've got a new product coming out, which we call AI Review, that we just launched last week, actually, where we now have AI systems that can review the output of what the people did for an additional layer of uh, correction. Uh, and then that goes back into, we reconstruct the files and put them back to where they came from. And this all happens in one uh, uh, sort of continuous workflow that you can build directly in the platform. 
So if we go a layer deeper, uh, we just last week re released our models, which we call 3.5, and these are about six times larger than the models that we had this time last year when I presented. Um, and they're trained for the first time with reinforcement learning. So we used to do uh, supervised fine tuning, and now we do supervised fine tuning with reinforcement learning on top. And the way that that works is we have the baseline model. Um, it goes through a prediction step where a human linguist will uh, correct the output. And then that goes back into the model for continuous training. And for those of you who have used it or looked at it, you see this happen actually right in front of your eyes. So there's no sort of process where it goes off and you wait a couple hours and you train a model. It happens continuously while the workflow is running. And so that's all um, been operationalized in the past uh, week or two with our new models. And the results are really great. So this is just a little bit of technical information about them. There are about 1.3 billion parameters, which you would say, wow, that seems really small relative to these 200 or 300 or 500 billion parameter models. I think the way to think about that is you don't need as much broad knowledge for the translation task. And I think the real thing to think about, and we'll talk about this later when you're thinking about what's coming next, there's a performance cost uh, component of this. And so if you can build very uh, you know, smaller sort of single digit billion parameter models that are very focused on a specific task, that helps a lot with model accuracy and boy, does it make the, the cost really efficient, which is uh, what we do um, with our business. Uh, and the, like I said, you build these models and they're, they turn out to be really, really great. So the um, gray bar is the models that we had this time last year. We had an interim model that we were working with in the fall, which we called V3, which we didn't end up releasing. And then V3.5, which we just released uh, last week gives you about 10 to 15% performance improvement over what we had just uh, one year ago. So the pace of innovation is really, really fast right now. I think that's broadly true across AI, um, but that's partly a function of there's more compute available, there's more data available, the tooling's getting a lot better. And so uh, we'll show how these translation quality results translate into some of the work we've done on actual cases in just a minute. And this is a chart showing some of the other model providers. And the point, the point here is that when you can do uh, supervised fine tuning and reinforcement learning on actual use cases, so take a broad model and narrow it down to a specific use case, you get significantly higher accuracy uh, relative to even like a big model like GPT-4. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, uh, that's our company and our product, and let me talk a little bit about some of the work we've done. So the first one is uh, with BiblioNexus, uh, working on the Aquifer project with Ben and Thomas, who I think are both here. Um, and we're using the whole platform here. We've just uh, delivered a bunch of uh, work in the current quarter, uh, like I said, for the Aquifer project. And we've got combinations of our linguists and uh, uh, people reviewing on their side that are domain experts. Uh, cer certainly some fine-tuning work that we've got going uh, to try to get the quality to the right level. So I think, you know, if you sort of think like AI has completely solved the problem, you should talk to Thomas and Ben. There's plenty of work for people to do left, I should say. Um, and so that's a really exciting project where it's starting to get to a reasonable scale. And we're looking across five or six different languages here, some of them high resource, some of them lower resource like Hindi. And this shows uh, the accuracy. So we compute a metric in our platform which we call word prediction accuracy, which is simply the fraction of words that uh, the AI system generates versus the fraction of words that people correct. And so if you look at the baseline model and then the fine tune model, you see about a 10 to 15% accuracy gain, which is what we see in other domains as well. So this is consistent with what we see in commercial domains. And in general, where these models are right now is AI doing about 90% of the work and people doing about 10%. And that's up massively from a number of years ago when we released our V1 models, which were the first transformer models back in late 2017, early 2018, this figure was around 40%. So the models have gotten considerably better. My, my suspicion is that to go from you know, 90 to 100, to 100 is much harder than going from 45 to 90. So there's, there's still a lot of very important creative work that people are doing, and I think all, that just says like, you really should be doing customization and fine tuning. That's really what gives you the best outcomes, and that's where, where people really come in. Okay, so that's BiblioNexus. Uh, like I mentioned, we, oh, we went off the bottom of the page there. So we've been working with Bible Project for about four years now. Uh, that's kind of our longest running project in this community, and they started 
during COVID, this must have been, I met Mike in like 2020, early 2020, something like that. So in Donald, and uh, a lot of the work that you see in the Bible Project in other languages we've done over the years, including uh, a big uh, Spanish language experience that they just did in the last six months, I think, uh, that we did and has all gone through our platform. And a lot of the, you know, when we started with the Bible Project, we didn't have like anybody in our linguist community with any type of theological or pastoral training. And so all of the sourcing and development that we've done over the last number of years, like we still got work to do to build out that talent pool. Um, but I, I think we've got kind of the, I, I, would, I would think maybe the largest community of people, of you know, general freelancers online that have done this type of work uh, working with us right now. We have scoured the world looking for these people, including in low resource languages, uh, which is, for example, the work that we've done with Biblica. Um, we had this Balochi project where we found like one speaker of Balochi somewhere. I don't even know where we found this person uh, to translate the book of Daniel. Um, and now we're scaling this up to some other languages as well. So, uh, and I think what's really, really cool about the uh, contextual learning is that for low resource languages, it really works very well. Um, for higher resource languages, it takes more data to move the model in a certain direction. Uh, but for the low resource languages where you don't have much data at all, uh, the models can very quickly lock on to a specific use case. They may not necessarily ge generalize very well, like a model fine-tuned for Bible translation would probably be terrible for translating a news article, but it'll do that job really, really well. And so you can get a lot of mileage from just having a, a small amount of data. Uh, so I think this is Michelle and her team doing this work. So we're really grateful for uh, these partners. I think we've all learned together in these projects. It's, it's a pretty different domain than what we work in commercially and even in the public sector. But I think it's important work, um, and somebody joked with me, like, if you get into translation, you end up working with the church and the army, and we work with both. So that's where, that's where you kind of end up, I think. Okay, and these, so these are some of the partners that we've worked with over the years, uh, building out this community of, of linguists and models and data. Okay, as promised, I've only got 15 minutes left, and I'm gonna finish up quickly. So I was sort of thinking about, like, what, when, if, if I come here, if we're all here convened next year, what are the things that we might see in the next year? What would those things be that I'm excited about? And I'm not gonna like prognosticate way far into the future. I think that's actually quite hard to do right now given the level of research and investment that's going into AI. It's just very difficult to predict what's gonna happen in the future. But it's not too hard to see what's gonna happen in the next year. And I think one thing that I'm really excited about is moving from translation to generation. Um, so you'd be really surprised. You can write uh, in, non, you know, a, an English language description of something, and assuming you have a fine-tuned model and some data, you can generate a surprisingly good piece of new content, whether that's text or video, um, uh, immediately without going through a translation step. And there are lots of applications where that is going to dramatically increase access to information. So we've got this working on our platform now for about 30 plus languages. We've got a lot of work to do uh, to make it really robust. Um, and we've got workflow tooling around it too, so you can generate stuff and if you don't like it, you can send it off to somebody for verification. Um, we've built in model provider choice. We have customers who are really interested in experimenting with open source models, so we can do that for you if you want. And then we've got the fine tuning to human feedback. Um, and there's a lot of open-ended work to do uh, here. So I'm, I'm, I think this is gonna be, in, a, in not even a year's time, but in six months' time, this is gonna be a solution that people really find a lot of value from relative to just trying to do translation all the time. Okay, so that's generation. Um, some of you might have seen this one. Uh, so these very long context windows for low resource languages. So last year, uh, Dan Jarafsky's lab, he's a uh, linguistics professor at Stanford, uh, published a, there was a paper about this um, machine translation one book benchmark, and um, you know, this is kind of a classic sort of Dan Jarofsky paper, which is you take a linguistics field manual, you know, when you go get a degree in linguistics, they send you off to like Papua New Guinea or somewhere, and you go live there for six months writing down a descriptive grammar of a language. And then usually these things end up in a library somewhere. But it turns out what you can do with this descriptive grammar is you can just shove the whole thing into a large language model, with a lexicon and having never seen that language before, in this case, Kalamang, which doesn't appear anywhere on the internet, you can get a surprisingly good translation model. 
Um, and so the results, this actually was in the uh, Google's Gemini 1.5 technical report that they showed to demonstrate the efficacy of using a really large context window. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's some things, I put a star next to it because it's like, it's not a written language. You know, there's this Latin script orthography that is in the grammar. And so would this work for, you know, non Latin script languages or other things where um, you're sort of generating things outside that are even slightly technical in nature? Like, could you just generate a Kalamang New Testament using this method? My suspicion would be not very well. Um, but you, you know, it's worth trying. And, uh, and, but I think that these long context windows, you can very quickly see there's gonna be a world where you just shove a whole description of the item that you wanna generate into the input, and that will massively improve the quality of the output. There's some costs associated with that and some performance associated with that, but I think that will all get solved. So I'm really excited about that as well. And then the last thing is multimodal. So uh, I think you know, there have been these videos like of Javier Malay going viral on X slash Twitter, uh, and there are a bunch of these video translation and dubbing apps with voice cloning. These seem to have really captured people's imagination. I think there are a lot of questions about, you know, sort of the legality of voice cloning and copyrights and things like that. And so I think you'll see enterprise versions of these, and my suspicion would be that these technologies, will, you know, we'll certainly have this in the platform in the next little bit. There'll be versions of these that are just enormously useful as we live in this kind of TikTok world where people prefer to consume video, this is gonna be really a medium that will broaden access to information. Okay, thank you very much. Not my deck, but I could try to speak to it if you want. <laughs> While they figure this out. My name is Nick. I'm the CEO of a technology company called Gargantua. I am also the global technology strategist for the Lausanne movement. This is Joanna Ng. She is the chief AI officer at Gargantua. There we go. All right. This is me. Okay, great. Um, and we're here to give you a sneak peek of Lausanne's digital ecosystem for the global church. But before we do that, can we read some scripture together? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, this, this passage has been um, deeply significant for me. It really had a profound impact on the way that I do work and just a lot of the things that I do in my career. Um, and so let's please read with me. This is Jesus speaking right before he was betrayed. Uh, in John 17, he says, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And to me, this is a picture of unity that Jesus prays for over the body of Christ. And unity in and of itself has many values. Um, but here, specifically, it's so that the world may believe that the Father sent Jesus. This is missional, it's evangelical. And when I think about missions and evangelism, I think about a preacher preaching from the pulpit or a missionary being sent out to a different country. Those activities are critical. But here, we see the way that we love each other, the way that we work together, share our lives and our resources with each other. Through that, people are gonna get saved. And to me, that kind of blew my mind. That it didn't really make sense to me, immediately, at least. Um, and as a technologist, I would look at technology and its power to connect people really, really powerfully. And I wondered, what role does technology have in the advancing of unity in the body of Christ? And I believe by the end of the presentation, you're going to see a picture of what digital unity could look like through a digital ecosystem. So let's jump in. Here's my agenda. We're going to first look at the current digital landscape for the global church. Then we'll get a look at digital unity. What does that look like? What could that look like through a platform model? And then we'll see a glimpse of, at the ecosystem in action and then some ways to participate. All right. 
Okay, current landscape, let's look at the world first. This is Google. Google's got a number of different apps. They solve a number of different user problems really, really well. There are individual squares on your phone, um, and they do different things. But are they really individual? Are they really separate? No, they're not. There is a network of pipes connecting all these apps, flowing user data in and out of those apps into a multitude of different hubs. And in those hubs, they do a variety of things. One thing they do is they build a giant, massive user graph. And that user graph is extremely valuable. You can use that user graph to formulate different user experiences for your different apps. You can build really robust recommendation engines. Um, you can build powerful ad targeting models as well. They are unified in, this, in a sense. So now let's look at our world. We've got a bunch of apps, and they're all really cool too. They do a lot of cool things as well. But would we say that they're connected to each other? Well, there's some connections right now. So I see Bible Project videos and YouVersion's Bible app. So you know, we're moving in the right direction. But when you think about user data, we are siloed. And this is probably one of the most valuable pieces of data that we have. And as that data gets connected to others, the value of that rises exponentially. So what if this was possible? This potential is, it was extremely intriguing to me. So imagine if we had a user graph that could address two and a half billion Christians in the world. That would inform us and help us to really serve and love our users in a much better way. And I would argue that we can't even really do that without this kind of information. And this would help us build better personalization strategies across our apps. We could have better recommendation engines. And instead of optimizing for advertising revenue, what if we could optimize for spiritual maturity or helping you learn about the father's love better? Because we all know that if you grew up without a loving father at home, your journey to understanding the father's love is very different than if you had a loving dad at home. And so that information is critical for us to love and serve at scale. So this drew me closer. And then I started to look at Lausanne, and Michael O oh had this vision for Lausanne as platform, and that drew me even further in. So I wanted to look at Lausanne. So let's take a quick glimpse at Lausanne. Billy Graham was a global missionary. He traveled the world preaching the gospel, and he met tons of people, but he realized that they didn't know each other. And he figured that if he could make those connections, that he could multiply missions and accelerate the Great Commission. So 50 years ago in 1974 in Lausanne, Switzerland, the first Lausanne Congress happened and the Lausanne movement was born. And from this movement, a number of good concepts and ideologies came to bless the global church. The Lausanne Covenant, concept of unreached people groups, uh, the 1040 window, the list goes on. Uh, but these concepts didn't come directly out of Lausanne. Lausanne is a convening entity. So they create the space, they bring people like you in, and from your relationships that God creates these things. And so we were looking at, at that convening energy. What if in the future we could take that energy and apply that in the digital space and really multiply that energy? What's the potential for that? And in my eyes, that would be a, a, a potential of a global collaboration at scale. And through those relationships, what could the Lord do at scale? And I think there was something extremely compelling there. And so when I look at Lausanne, I see three main assets. The first is neutrality. Lausanne does not have a dog in the fight. They want to look at what you're already doing and accelerate that mission and help you to do it better. They're not trying to change those missions or they don't even have a bias towards it. The second is trust. So five decades of operating this movement and blessing the church has created a deep, significant amount of relational equity with these ministries around the world. And then there's scale. Some reports show that there's 5,000 or so of the largest organizations that are affiliated and connected to the Lausanne movement. So when I looked at platform, it happens to be that the, most, the three most ingredients, three most important ingredients to a platform are these. And trust and scale don't come easily. So I'm wondering, is the Lord setting up Lausanne to steward this platform into the world? But then again, when you think about Lausanne, I think of academics, 
and seminarians, how are they going to build technology at scale like this? This is a difficult technological problem. And so that's where I come in. Um, who's seen the movie Interstellar? Hands. Who remembers the name of the black hole in Interstellar? Oh, nobody. Okay. Spoiler alert. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. So in this movie, there's a giant black hole. The name of it is Gargantua. This is where I got the name. And, and, and basically what happens in this movie is the main character goes into the black hole. Instead of getting crushed, what happens is all this amazing stuff inside. He travels to, through time and space. This is a, like the climactic point in the movie, and, and he saves the day. And so my hope in launching this firm was that the Holy Spirit would rest at the center of it, and his weight would create a gravitational pull, pulling all the best technologists from the, around the world in so that we can build the kingdom of God together. And that's happening right now. And like, by his grace, this is not my doing. Um, and I, I'm able to pull together some of the top-tier talent from around the world, from the leading, the best leading organizations. Um, and they're all Christian. They all love Jesus. And they want to take the skills that they learn into the world and bring that to the kingdom of God. And so we're locked and loaded. We're ready to go. We can build, this tech, we can build the technology of things ourselves, but really this is a platform. It doesn't work without partners like you. So let's look at what this ecosystem is. So think of Apple's App Store. So in Apple's App Store, what it does is it helps third-party developers to create apps for people on iPhone. So we want to do the same thing. Instead of Lazan creating things themselves, we want to empower you all and everyone online to create these apps for the body of Christ. And so even though in the beginning we're going to have to create some apps just to really kickstart the ecosystem, the hope and the bet is that you guys will build that killer app and that app will then go out in vi virality, it'll scale, and it'll impact significantly. And, and there's, a, there's a core component of this that, that I want to talk about. And that's interoperability. And so whenever you're building an app, you've got to build, there's a huge cost to building it, and then you've got to get users, which is also a significant monetary cost. And so what we want to do is create all of our apps within a container. That container can live on any website. Lazan's got a large network. They all have digital assets such as websites and apps. Those containers can live on any of those apps. Thereby, you're immediately getting distribution. And so that's kind of the first core value of the ecosystem is distribution. Since these apps can live anywhere, they can live on any of Lazan's global partners. And they all have websites. As long as they see value in your app, they can take it and plop that on their website, on their app and then they can provide value to their users. In return, what we're gonna give the host website is the ability to learn about their users because everyone needs to understand and learn, their, learn about their users more. And so if you've got an app that's creating a feed, they'll be able to understand how users are engaging in that feed. Those analytics are driven back to the, to the host website, then they can inform their ministry strategy. The second core value are shared AI components. So when you look at a recommendation engine, it is costly to build and difficult to do well. So if we build one, we should share it with everybody. So as we build things in this ecosystem, all these components are modularized, platformized, so that others can use it. And the third piece, which I think is probably the most compelling piece, is collaborative data. Again, go back to the user graph that Google has. Why can't we extend our user graph using all the data that we have across the body of Christ, right? With that information, again, it can be extremely compelling. I'm going to hand it to Joanna to talk about data a little bit. All right. Because we have the privilege to build one platform for global churches to unify digitally in order to enable us to unify spiritually, I think we should set a better example to the world. Uh, and in this platform, we advocate fair trade of data. Do you have fair trade of data today? Well, no. Uh, at two, because of the time limit, to cite two major features of fairness is transparency and transactional. So when Google use your data, is it, trans uh, is it transparent? No, you don't know who you, they sell your data to. 
Is it transactional? They make trillion dollars. Did you get a dime of it? No. And as the light of the world, as technologists building this platform for God's kingdom, I'm sure we can do better than that. And the reason why we don't have fair trade of data is there is the missing enablement pieces not to enable it. Uh, and there's, of course, from the world, there is no motivational factor for them to share their profits with you, which in the ecosystem of the kingdom, we definitely can do better. So um, in, the in this platform, we have a chance now to model for the world what fair trade of data is like. That the owner of the data, whether it is a user or an enterprise, that they the ownership is back to you so that you have the right to, to um, number one, to decide where you want to contribute your data and for what reason. And then also have the right to benefit from what you contribute to. So I give you an example. If someone, an organization, a partner of Lausanne, wants to study how to reach the 35 and under through the digital world, uh, and you want to build a model what day of the t uh, what time of the day that they are best engaged, what media form that they are best engaged, uh, what content form do they best engage, then the organization could call, uh, put out a call for data uh, that uh, may it be uh, version, Glue, or Christianity Today, they can call for this data, and then if you, being the user or the um, enterprise or the third party, you buy into the why, you can contribute your data, and there is a transactional form that you can benefit from this data, because whatever is learned from this model because of the size of the data collaboratively are globally shared. So there is this user graph that keep track of the entity, whether it's a user organization, of the different aspect of the data, whether it is the content consumption, whether it is geographical location, whether it is the, uh, the channel that, um, that it engage in, then the, if you want to participate on one of the call because you believe in the study, then you can contribute the data in this new infrastructure called anonymized data. You can donate for the cause that you choose. And then therefore you can get to be the part of the ecosystem benefit from this model by enabling using the model or get a discount on the subscription or some form of transactional uh, so that the, um, the data that you contribute, you know what is it used for instead of not knowing and you know what you will get the benefit from rather than you don't benefit from at all. So, um, and from these uh, data, then the AI model will be built and then um, it hopefully will enable the um, various ministry ac across the globe from being able to be more informed how to outreach, how to disciple, how, uh, to know what is the effectiveness of your ministry, or even what is the model people would be incented to donate to support your cause. And of course, there's a lot more behind the platform than the five minute that's allowed. And so I pass the time back to Nick. Okay, now let's look at the ecosystem in action. This is a prototype, first Lausanne app in the ecosystem. It's called My Global Missions. What this does is it gives a personalized feed for ways to get involved in global missions. And so for the user, they get a curated, personalized feed that continuously learns. It figures out what's most interesting to you, where's your calling in this world, and helps surface up those ways to get engaged. For the host website, remember this app can live on any website. And so the host website gets value, one, they can provide this value to their users that they feel like is valuable, right? Um, secondarily, they get to learn about these users. I already talked about this. They'll have a dashboard with analytics that provide actionable user insights. As you understand what callings or what missions that your users are interested in, this can inform the way that you're addressing them, the way that you're communicating to them. 
And this right now is about a, a general feed for ways to get involved in global missions. But let's say you're a discipleship ministry. Let's say you're part of a discipleship consortium. And you want to swap out this content for testimonials. You can do that. Remember, all these pieces are modularized so that you can swap out this content and plug in a different kind of content and utilize what's already there. Right? And so from a platform perspective, we chose this app not only because we felt like it's going to be valuable for our users, but also because of the components that build it. And so if you take this part, there's a content scraper that pulls content off of newsletters and websites. There's a large language model that labels that content and summarizes it and stores it in a repository. There's a content management system that stores that information. There's a user graph, of course, learning about our users. And then there's a recommendation engine that's trained on the user graph to serve up that curated list of content. All those pieces can be broken apart and used in different places. And so if you've got a similar use case for a recommendation engine, for example, you can take this and see how it performs. Let's say that that use case is too different from the specific use case. You go one abstraction layer up, and you work at the, app, at the user graph level. So there's always one layer that's going to be shareable and add value to other developers. Yeah. OK, last slide. Get your phones ready. There's QR codes coming after. There's four ways to get involved in the ecosystem. Partners, these are users of apps. You take apps that you see in the ecosystem and you can plop them on your site or on your app. Developers create apps in the ecosystem. Data collaborators provide data to the ecosystem so that we can do things like build user graphs and help inform large language models and do all this fancy stuff with data. And then, of course, content providers. Um, content, we all know, is instrumental in catalyzing change. Um, so we want to build a large repository of content to serve up in and through all these other apps. That's my contact info on the left. Early sign up form on the right, or on my left. Um, let's do this together, because we can't do this alone. And as, as we come together and work together, let's get a version of digital unity. And then in hopes that that will take us one step closer to unity of the body of Christ. And we can do that and try to make heaven more crowded. Thank you. Good afternoon. You guys, you're doing very well. We are the last speaker slot before we land the plane on a fantastic day number two with another practical AI panel. So uh, I'm excited. Can I get a quick hands for, are there fellow entrepreneurs in the house? If you're an entrepreneur, hands up. Okay, good. Last night we were talking with a group and saying, are there other filthy capitalists in the room? I, I didn't say that because you might not, put, oh, okay, some hands in the air. Good, good. Well, I'm speaking specifically to you. So those entrepreneurs motivated by their faith to join God in the renewal of all things, I hope you lean in. To those who are building AI, the responsibility, I hope you lean in. And uh, my goal is to throw out this idea of, can we be a part of leveraging AI to reach a relational renaissance in the years ahead? Okay, I'm gonna throw that out, but first, uh, I wanna ask, a question that I think a lot of us have been asking, and that's really around the measurement of AI success. How are we going to know if AI is successful or not, right? So fast forward a few years, and I'm talking from the perspective of humanity as a society, right? Amago Day, we are made in God's image, we have a creation mandate, we are out, we are, we are inventing, we are creating, we're bringing things into this world, and we've got a pretty mixed bag in terms of a historical track record as humanity, right? So we can, we can look at um, great things like aspirin, or we can look at asbestos. We can look at uh, things we're not sure about, like the internet, mobile phones. We can look at the devices of the social media. We can look at penicillin or lead gasoline. We can go on and on. We have a mixed bag as inventors. And so when we think about 
how is a simple framework going to be able to tell us was what we brought into this world for artificial intelligence successful or not? Uh, I think a very common framework that many people are talking about right now is efficiency, economic productivity. How can we get more GDP per capita um, that we can appoint to AI and say AI has helped us to become more efficient and productive as a society? Some good things there, some questions there. I don't think that is the ultimate measure. Um, there is the measure of better healthcare outcomes. I've had the privilege of helping many teams get models into health and medical and wellness um, opportunities, and there is so much that God is doing through us to help better outcomes, be that longevity and, and, and lower infant mortality. There are good things, but again, I'm not gonna put forward that as a way to ultimately measure the success or not. Uh, another good thing, but not necessarily the ultimate thing, would be the access to education. One of the best applications of AI, personalized AI learning, AI tutoring for everything at every stage of life, for all topics. There's great opportunity that many here are working on, and yet a good thing, but not necessarily the right thing to hold up. So to do this, I go to Matthew 22 and the greatest commandment. So just at a very high level, I think, God calls us to love God and to love others. Love the Lord your God, love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, I think of man's chief end to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I think of, very simply, I think of relationships. And so I'm gonna throw out that, that, that challenge, that idea, that thesis, that maybe the idea of looking back and saying, did AI deepen or diminish our relationships? Our relationship with God our relationship with each other, with, our, with, with ourselves, with God's creation, did it deepen or did it diminish? And, uh, and I think that many of us would agree that when we think about uh, poverty as broken relationships, when we think about the opposite of that and true wealth, prosperity, flourishing, uh, is when we see great, healthy, strong relationships as God intended them again, across these different relationships with God, with each other, with ourselves, and with creation. So I'm going to put that out there, and that's what we're going to look at. I want to hit it from a couple different angles today. So the first one, uh, I had the privilege 10 years ago to go through a business accelerator with Praxis. So I was building uh, my last AI startup, Cloud Factory, and uh, we were starting to get a little bit of traction. I had nine months to go with a cohort of fellow believers who were trying to go out and solve things. And it was so formational. I had the opportunity to really reform a lot of the theology of work, theology of entrepreneurship, and it set me and Cloud Factory up for a, uh, a great season of growth, a lot of challenge, a lot of joy. Uh, and so I had the opportunity since then, anytime they call, I'm like, I'm there. So I've got to go back and mentor. Uh, the last few years I've been able to serve on the board. And so at Praxis, we look at this idea of redemptive entrepreneurship. And so you'll see here a bunch of logos. You can't read them. Uh, uh, my company's on there, but there's each of these logos represents, again, an entrepreneur who said, I, motivated by faith, want to go out and I want to solve something that's broken. I want to join God in the renewal and redemption of all things. Every corner of the earth advance the kingdom of God. And there's great stories that are represented here. So for 12 years, these programs have taken nonprofits, for-profits through. And we now have this great community of funders, founders, and innovators. Uh, and we've been asking this question, how do we think about this, this major issue of our time being artificial intelligence? Do we have a unique contribution to make to a very busy conversation right now? And specifically, uh, uh, our partner of theology and culture at Praxis is Andy Crouch, who is writing a current draft of what we're calling the Redemptive AI Thesis. So it's still early, but I wanted to give a little sneak preview because I think that you'll see, jumping to number four, the one that I'm really passionate about is represented again here, of serving human relationships and not replacing them, okay? And so we're taking uh, what we call the redemptive frame and trying to apply it to the age of AI, saying, how do we look at the three ways that we work? Exploitative, ethical, 
and redemptive? And how do we apply those across the three dimensions of work? Leadership, strategy, and operations. And so this framework that we use at practice as entrepreneurs, as venture builders, uh, and as, as investors and funders, we are trying to apply it to AI and beginning to build a thesis with some of these, these moves or directions that you see here. Now, the reason that I'm passionate of saying, can we build AI that leads to a relational renaissance is because I do not believe we are on that trajectory today. Okay? I do not think if we sit here as the church and allow things to continue to play out, that is going to naturally happen. In fact, I would argue this is a, a roadmap that I believe is setting us on a trajectory that may be very different from that. And so the first one is where we sit today. Text generation. I love Ryder earlier today. Word, cal word calculators. Right? We've got this thing with a, most of the internet compressed into it. It's able to do this great predictive token generation that makes it look like it's so smart. And that's what we're all talking about, right? We're all, this thing is so smart. The world, though, is moving to what I believe is the next feature to be unlocked, and it's long-term memory. Now, many of you may already have this. If you're running your own local LLM, you may have, you know, built your own version of this uh, like I've played with, and you can take, so right now, it's a very short-term memory, right? Every session that we have, we're effectively having to tell it again, remind it who we are and what we do, what our organization is, and all these sorts of things. When long-term memory gets turned on, Every session, every chat we've had, right, we can plug in email, we can plug in documents, you can, there's so many information that gets there and it'll stay there for days, months, years. And it leads to this place, and the reason it's not unlocked is because we can technically do it today, but we don't know yet how to deal with this because it moves to, it knows me. So it's smart, and now it knows me. And now, it may know me better than my loved ones or it's the perception that this thing knows me better than my loved ones. It may even feel like it knows, it, knows me better than myself. And we kind of want that, and there's kind of great application and convenience in that, and yet it's also so scary. The next feature that's getting unlocked, and we have really early versions of this, but it's not just a text interface, but we move into a voice and a visual interface. So, Many of you are using the app where you can talk and it's not perfect, but you imagine being able to perfectly real-time voice interact back and forth. That is the main interface. Then you move to with video. Now it's not just perfect voice, but now it's a video, an avatar that we're able to fully interact with. And of course the third interface is humanoids and robots that we all know are very much uh, accelerating today. And it moves to this feeling, again, of it's so smart, it knows me, and it's so real. Next feature unlocked is emotions, empathy, personality, right? Again, we're seeing early versions of this. A lot of people working. Of course, this is not, this is not a conscious thing. There is no spirit imbued here, right? But it's mimicking. It's mimicking the ability to detect and respond to emotions and to pretend like it empathizes. And it moves to this place of drawing us into fake emotional dependence on different topics, problems we may be going through, et cetera. And it, again, adds this idea of they're there for me. They are there for me. The last one is we shift the Overton window so quickly, right? And I, I know that we're all hoping, working, and praying that this does not happen but there's a lot of evidence that current trajectory would be that there's a normalization of AI relationships, where it actually becomes common, potentially even legal, in, in, in some, some world that I hope doesn't exist or is very far away. Um, and it moves to not only are they there for me, but that we're close. We are close. So this roadmap of technical features that we are all seeing coming and maturing and improving very, very quickly I believe could lead to a trajectory that is very far away from what my hope and dream would be is that AI would unlock a relational renaissance, but instead something very different. How do we change it? As the church, as AI builders and entrepreneurs um, out in the world, how can we do this? So these are some design principles, again, just starting to think through. First and foremost, if we can build AI that would allow us to push, push back our users to interact and have human connection. 
How do we push users back to our loved ones, right? So yes, not pull them in for more screen time and attention, but instead push them back to loved ones. How can we push back to professionals when necessary? Because there are just certain emotional boundaries that need to be respected. So coaching may be great, counseling may be getting yellow, therapy <laughs> needs to be left to some professionals. So building systems that knows when to push people back to their loved ones, push them back to professionals in certain boundaries is really important. The third one would be similar of how do we continue to push people with our, the AI that we're building back still into groups and community. Community such that, like we have here today. The beauty of coming together and gathering as a group, doing it even physically in the real life where we can see each other and interact is beautiful. Um, doing it online is fantastic as well. For those that are participating online is great. For people who will be joining the AI Collective that Faith Tech announced today, right? These communities are really, really important. So how do we leverage great things from AI while still pushing back into real life community? This one is the low hanging fruit I hope we can all agree to, okay? Can we stop naming our AI bots with human names, right? The anthropomorphizing that we are doing with AI right now is something that we just need to take leadership and say, we don't need to humanize what is not human. There is a hierarchy of creation here, and we need to respect that and lead that as the church. And so maintaining transparency and awareness is something we've heard and talked about. And I think it starts with how we, how we name and how we kind of just create our AI to not act like it is human and be named like it's human. And the last one is a little bit less of a let's not do this. It's more of a AI can be used to actually strengthen relational capacity. We can equip people, we can equip our users in a way that will actually have them grow in self-awareness or be able to empath empathize and relate and build connection better, understand how God wired other people and connect them to them. Um, lots of interesting things I believe that we can do again as entrepreneurs and AI builders. So I mentioned a little bit about uh, three AI hats right now, Cloud Factory, uh, I've handed over CEO Reigns, I'm now the exec chair there, so not spending my day to day. Uh, continue to be a venture partner and board member at, at Praxis, but I'm spending most of my time uh, on a new venture. So Sprout AI Studio is a venture building studio. Very early days, but I'm very excited. So in partnership with Praxis and in partnership with two amazing uh, people, one of which Carson is in the back today, if you've had a chance to meet him here, we believe that there's an opportunity to help guide the age of AI towards a more redemptive future. And I believe that there's regulatory opportunities, there's a lot of opportunities we've talked about that, that the church can do, but specifically as entrepreneurs, we want to say, can we bottoms up, co-found and create new startups that can be uh, beacons, examples, help establish norms in new industries that could really change some of the trajectories and how these AI systems are built in the coming months and years. And so specifically, uh, we're trying to build 15 redemptive AI ventures over the next five years, and we do that again in a studio model where we bring capital, uh, sometimes we bring ideas, but very often we're an institutional co-founder to a redemptive entrepreneur, someone motivated by their faith. We partner with them with capital, with resource, um, but we work with them every day. So it is like shoulder to the plow for the first 12, 18 months to try and go through ideation and validation, building a minimal viable product, starting to pursue product market fit, hopefully some revenue, and then we graduate out um, with them getting a dedicated team and, and, and raising a seed round of capital and, and continue to be an investor and board member. So this is a, a venture studio model that we're really excited uh, to be pursuing. And right now, a lot of our time in the early days is around ideation. And so we ideate through this framework of the major issues of our time. And so this is from Praxis, it's, we call them the, opportunity, the Opportunities for Redemptive Innovation, or the ORIs. And so these are 34 major issues of our time. Um, I don't like to play favorites, but I will. Uh, so some of those highlighted, we find a lot of our ideas right now are in the area of enriching the family. So from dating and parenting and elderly care, that whole cycle, 
or managing technology in our everyday lives, in our families, in our homes, managing screens and the effects of screens, um, the, the new forms of education or something, but there's everything from adoption and, and fostering to mental health to um, sustainable food and on and on. So this is a great framework to begin to get a narrative of theology and culture about how we can go out and join God in what he's doing. And yet we also are again focusing through this thesis that we believe that you can use AI to coach personal relationships, that you can actually use AI to deepen and pull people into better relationships. I don't know that it's the natural use, but I believe it is a powerful use. And so we're beginning to think through different ideas. Uh, I'm gonna give you quick hits on a few of them as I close here. Uh, these are at different stages from concept through to doing some prototyping. All of them, we would love to get feedback, improvements, iterations, or new ideas. The first one, is around parenting. And I may be building this just for me and my wife, um, but maybe others will find it interesting as helpful as well. Um, the ability to use AI to give great advice in those times of daily crisis that we have as parents. No matter what stage you're at, kids don't come with a manual. And so we, if it's your six month old that hasn't slept through the night yet, if it's your toddler who melts down in the grocery store every time you go, or if it's your 14 year old who won't come out of their bedroom, there's so much that we are having to learn every day. And so getting some of that advice in the moment is important, but what we're actually, our heart is to say, to go from crisis and the fires of every day to how do we help support families develop new habits as a family so that they can begin to flourish in a, in a longer term more sustainable way. And one thing we've learned kind of our early uh, exploration and testing is that parents are, are asking for not just a chatbot interface that they use on their phone, they want, they want tangible, visible reminders. They want real things to help with follow through. Great, here's a plan, an action plan that we can walk through. This feels really good. This coaching was really, really helpful. But now I actually have to change habits. And so, uh, we're playing with the idea of prototyping actual kits, AI-assisted, generated, digital fabrication, real physical kits that get shipped out to families, to parents as part of new action plans that would help them establish those habits. So it could be uh, magnetic chore charts or checklists that you put on the wall or personalized journals or uh, little bathroom sign reminders to wash your hands for your toddlers, all these sorts of things that we believe that we can use AI again to generate personalized and deliver to parents to support them to establish new habits and new rhythms to flourish as a family. Um, the second one is the only thing harder than parenting. If, if any of you uh, know people in the situation, is co-parenting, okay? So co-parenting in the midst of a very broken and hard situation. I've got family here right now, uh, and it's extremely hard. Very times the court will actually order uh, uh, the co-parents to communicate through a system, an online system where all messages have to go. So we're looking at that opportunity of saying, what if you could put AI in there to help coach those co-parents to actually keep the kids' interests, uh, their best interests at, at top of mind? And so when you put a message in, if there's some coaching on maybe you wanna adjust tone before you actually send that message. They could probably use that for a lot of applications, actually. Uh, just a general kind of coaching of the tone in our messaging. Um, you could also give a reminder of who's in charge of certain court directives of like things like medical decisions for the kids, et cetera. Lots of opportunity, again, to coach, I believe, in what's a really heartbroken relationship. The next one is, the next three, real quick, friendships, right? As we get older, it's harder and harder to establish friendships, to meet new friends. So eHarmony for friends, right? The opportunity to say, how do we actually help use AI matching to bring people in at a time and a moment in history where extreme loneliness could not be a bigger issue, is there an opportunity to use AI to establish more friendships? Now, once you have those friends, here's another idea. Let's go out, right? You've got friends, but you know what? We're in ruts. We're busy. Our lives are complicated. Even trying to get people to go out nowadays can be really hard. So what if you have an AI Let's go out app that's coaching you and helping to remove the complexity and it knows schedules and looking for different opportunities of things that you guys like to do and it's encouraging you or this milestone's coming up for one of your friends. How can you get them to go out and celebrate them? And, and so that opportunity to 
even just coordinate who's in, who's out. Well, I'm in if they're not go- if they're going or not going, or I, uh, you know, there's three people, so we're going to commit to it. There's things that we can do to coach people and remove some of that friction, so we just get out, have more fellowship with our friends. Now, if you make new friends, you spend more time with those friends. As sinful, broken people, the next thing you might need is some relationship reconciliation. So, what does that look like? Now, here's the opportunity. To, to reach out through a third-party AI system to initiate some, some minor or major reconciliation with someone. And you can have that brokering and that coaching to try and, again, renew and redeem a broken relationship. The last one, in closing, is my favorite. Uh, I've got kids right now uh, that are 11 and 14, and they don't, when I was young, I played outside for hours every day. Every day, right? And uh, until, until I had to come in for supper, until it was dark. And it was like, don't go past that street, don't go past that street, otherwise, just come home by dark and we're good. That's how I, that's a lot of my years were, maybe some of you were. As you know, that's not what today is, right? Kids are lured inside because what's inside? Their screens. Parents also are a little bit less excited about them going out um, unsupervised to play. So it's led to a thing where it used to be at the age of seven that we would have unsupervised play outdoors. We would take risks. We would have adventures. There's formation that has happened that's not happening, and we're seeing this being measured now in what's happening in these next generations that are not getting outdoor play. And so what are the opportunities? We're examining and talking with different entrepreneurs and ideating in this area. One of those ideas is saying, what if we had adventure bands, a little Fitbit form kind of device Kids throw on, come home from school, throw on their adventure band, they run outside, and now they're able to enjoy time-tested games that are enhanced by AI in this adventure band. So you can imagine playing tag or hide and seek or capture the flag or going on treasure hunts in your neighborhood where now you have a little bit of an extra timer and kind of AI is adapting the difficulty to the different level of play and it's it's, it's uh, making some noises and kind of using a haptic vibrating when you get close to someone or, or the person who's it is getting really close to you or you're about to find the next waypoint or discovery. Or, and so the ability to enhance outdoor play to the point where kids want to be outside. And then, of course, yeah, there is some ability to track and geofence and parents to send a message, hey, it's time to come home for dinner. And so you can maybe ease the mind of parents to maybe let them play outside as well early ideas, looking for your input, looking for your help, and in fact, I had a t-shirt, I don't have a t-shirt, Carson? Carson's wearing a t-shirt, hand up Carson, in the very back there. We have some AI t-shirts that we brought with us, and I flew Frontier, and I can't afford the thousand dollars to take anything back with me, so we would love if anyone has any venture ideas around this thesis of deepening personal relationships with AI, I'd love to talk to you. Carson would love to talk to you. We'd love for you to take one of our t-shirts. Thank you.
cool. No, I'll go with it. Yeah. I even get a chair today. Look at this. Wow. Such kindness. Um, uh, that, that was awesome. I really enjoyed today's discussions. Um, uh, Mark, I feel like I, I found a new friend in, in you just, uh, just from this. We, we can be best friends. Um, we don't need, even need, a, well, I guess AI did connect us through this, uh, through this conference. Um, so lots of great questions. Uh, you can still submit your questions. Um, I'm going to try to get through as many as, uh, as possible in this panel. And of course, there's time for discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, one question which uh, stood out to me that, that came through here was uh, the, quote, trough of disillusionment will likely arrive in the next 18 months, uh, which is this person's guess for AI. Um, and uh, so any, any uh, responses on, do you think that's coming? And it, assuming it's coming, um, how do we expect that to impact uh, our own uses of AI? I can, seems, I can. seems difficult to make a very broad claim like that. I think there are certainly areas that are completely transformed, like code generation and text generation, but maybe other areas like, you know, mass unemployment or something like that, uh, or, you know, not something that maybe there's going to be a trough of disillusionment for people who think there's going to be mass unemployment. I probably would agree with that. Yeah, I'll chime in here too. Uh, in, in terms of the disillusionment, I mean, are, are, if they're talking about there's a bubble popping, I disagree with that. Like, when you look at applied AI, I, think, I feel like we're just scratching the surface there. For the most part, all the stuff out there right now, to me, they're toys. They're, they're fun toys that you can play with and they do really, really cool things, but really making enterprise value, extracting enterprise value out of that, that really not there yet. There's efficiency gains, and I think some people have talked about this, where something can do something faster because of some type of model that will help you do that. To me, that's useful. It's going to be entirely more disruptive when AI lets you do something fundamentally differently. It's like when cloud came. So everyone had servers on racks, and cloud came along, and what they did was they lifted and shifted. They took everything there, and they moved it over there. It's like when COVID came, Everyone went online, and then you would have happy hour on Zoom. It's, what is, it doesn't, like, you've got to think completely differently when you have this kind of technology, and the easiest way to do it is lift and shift, but once people start thinking ground up, if this was here from the beginning, and you erase all of history, how would things look, and that's when you're going to get true innovation, and we're just not there yet, so I don't know if that's exactly what they were talking about, but that's Well, I, I like what you're saying. I, I think that there, I think that there is just so many different things that are happening. We put it all under the umbrella of AI, but I mean, enterprise AI, consumer AI. There's, uh, there's different formats for, uh, of text. Video. There's so there's so much that's happening. I think there's many troughs of disillusionment that are happening. I mean, many of us have friends and colleagues who are feeling that way about ChatGPT because they just kind of made the first effort. It was kind of cool, and but they can't really get it to work for them. Um, so there's disillusionment there. I think so across all these different formats, product lines, consumer, enterprise, I think there's a lot of these troughs that we are hitting, but I think there's so much happening uh, that it just kind of shifts a little bit, like we're playing a, a game of tennis or ping pong right now, and I think that's, it's going to keep a sustained level of tornado for a while. Um, yeah, just my, my own... Uh, personal experience here. I, I don't think it's like 18 months dis disillusionment. It's hard to make that prediction, like you you said. But I think there is an element of disillusionment even now when people sort of th the impression is, oh, I can just uh, start using AI and my projects become easier. And I think it's proved out that that's definitely not the case. Um, there is a, a study from Andreessen. Um, uh, you all could look it up. I recommend. Uh, I think it's like 16 ways enterprise AI something. It was like published in March. But I think what it said was of AI budgets that are out there, 75% of the AI budget is still towards engineering work, not AI model usage, which kind of shows that just adoption doesn't mean that like there's not hard engineering work to do and, uh, and, and actual problems to solve uh, related to it. So I think that's also something people experience. Um, so another question 
Uh, when approaching LLMs and SLMs, um, which for, for those uh, that need that, that's small language models. Uh, <laughs> what, what, um, uh, what is the best way to clean up in-house data to better prepare for, um, for usage of those models? Hoping one of us is going to answer that. I, I'm not going to answer it. Oh, okay. You, I'm, I'm just going to comment you're like the, on your answer. You're like the best person <laughs> to answer it, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, I, I, I suppose that the first thing to say is like, you know, most people assume that they can come at these problems by just having more data is the solution, uh, and in reality, that's probably not the case. So I think the, the big thing is about making sure it's well structured. Um, and particularly when we think about you know building you know rag systems or you know. Um, do people know what I mean when I say a rag system? Yeah, most, but some shaking heads. But you know, so retrieval, um, you know, when we're putting the, those data sets together, I think it's about trying to make sure that you're only bringing stuff in that actually is useful for the task that you're trying to accomplish to begin with and then build from there, rather than trying to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah, I, mean, I think it depends on the type of data. If it's instruction fine-tuning data, um, Reinforcement learning methods are very sensitive to data quality, so um, there are methods for filtering that. If it's for text generation, different methods for that. So I, I think, you know, maybe activity that used to go into pre-training models now just transfers into doing these different types of work, like data filtering becomes really, really important. Um, so I just view it as maybe we don't have to spend as much time doing pre-training anymore. It's other people do that for us, and then there's higher work to do up, up the stack to get things into applications. Yeah, uh, I think the only thing I would add to, to your point is, um, I think, where is it? Uh, I met a friend, Bob, uh, during coffee, coffee break. Shout out, Bob, wherever you're at. Um, there you are, my friend. Um, so, so we were having the discussion around uh, these systems, and I think there is a general mis- uh, uh, so an expectation that like if you're getting into this technology, you're going to have to fine tune your own model and have your own model. Um, and actually, for I would say 98% of cases, that's just simply not not the case. And uh, these sort of retrieval-based methods, it doesn't mean you're not integrating your own data, right? Um, the the way you get value out of these systems is integrating your own data, but often it's not creating your own your own model. Um, the majority of problems you need to solve are solvable by other types of data integration, like retrieval. Um, kind of along with that, I, I, I can't find it. Again, there's a lot of questions, but there was some question about like, do we really need a, um, do we really need a Christian or Bible-specific large language model to fulfill these, uh, these, all these like chat applications that we're trying to build, or speech applications, or other things. Um, especially when you can, I think, uh, Spence, you mentioned the long context windows and putting a book, in that case it was translation, but of course you can put all sorts of instructions and things into these large models and have them fulfill um, various of your requirements. So any thoughts on that into the future of uh, sort of domain-specific language models um, in the Christian missional space versus just using these large models with in, in creative ways? Do we need? Um, I, I would love to know who asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> because this morning I really tried to explain why we need. Uh, so uh, um, if you want to, to steal the copyrights of Bibles, you don't need. If you want to give the data of people in sensitive countries, to open AI or other e existing LLM, you don't need. Okay, so if you just want to use it for yourself, of course you don't need. But if we want to to be, uh, I don't know the word in English, serious, serious, um, with what we all do and try to do for God's kingdom, yes, absolutely, we need, in my mind, and uh, that will help the the body of Christ if we have one. It does not mean that. In some cases, you should not use this or this existing model. And, and as 
some of you said we don't hear very well the other people speaking, so I guess you, you gave very good answers. <laughs> so, but, uh, but that's true that some of the issues can be solved with a good RAG, uh, a good database, uh, with a good retrieval in some cases. But, but it's also about who get the data. So I think that's one of the really, really sensitive points in my mind. Yeah, to add to that, I think you're right. It, it depends on what you're using it for. If it's for a ministry, but you're doing something very general, um, you don't need it because the ones out there are probably going to do better than the ones that you build. And remember, when you fine-tune something, there's a trade-off. You might fine-tune it. It might be more domain-specific, but then you're losing the intelligence to the base model. So you've got to know when you ought to be doing that. So... If you fine tune too much, now the model is really dumb. It's just going to look at the tunes that you've given it. And so you've got you've to plan that properly. Um, so there are cases that you do need it. So one thing that we're doing is creating a domain specific label maker. And so uh, if I want to label content, you know, the stuff out there will say things like this is a video, this is a talk, 20 minutes long, that sort of thing. Um, what if I want to know whether it's charismatic or not? Or if I want to know, whether it's an apologetics talk or if it's about some other Christian-y term, that's something that we'll need and we'll understand way better than the world will understand. So in that sense, if you're using an LLM to label things, I believe you'll need this kind of domain-specific knowledge because then we can do things like optimizing for spiritual maturity, like things like that. Those are things that we really understand and the world is going to get wrong. Or if we're building a discipleship app like we were talking about, um, this is very domain specific, so the language that's necessary is, is important. The precision is important. In that case, you need it, but in vastly other cases, you probably don't, but that's real, a real generalization. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm the moderator of this, uh, which means um, I have the privilege of just asking my own questions as well. <laughs> um, sorry if I, uh, if I don't get to all yours, uh, but... That's the way it works. Um, so I, I do notice we, we have a couple perspectives from industry here as well. So um, Mark and, and, uh, and, and Spence, I, I'm wondering um, if you have any comments or thoughts for, for this group, which I think the majority are coming from a missional sort of nonprofit side, um, really about um, some of the benefits of being willing to partner outside of the nonprofit space in, with industry companies, um, uh, for-profit companies, uh, specifically as related to this technology. Um, what are some of the benefits of, of doing that, or what's, what are some of the perspectives that maybe industry um, can provide that would benefit the kind of missional side? Any, any thoughts? I'd love to jump in on that. I, I think a little bit to what you're saying, Nick, was like the cost to go and build our own LLM like is just so high. And just generally, a lot of the tools that are being created, it's not, it's not easy, it's not cheap. And the opportunity to, uh, I go way back, probably 15 years ago, and, and had the opportunity to work with different companies that were licensing great intellectual property and software and engines that were there and it could be applied to even memorization things that could be exclusively licensed for Bible scripture memory. And so there's a lot of technology that is being developed by big tech and, and specifically more my role in the startups that are very hungry for the opportunity to, to license their technology. And so being creative, looking for opportunities, looking for great new tools that are out there and not being afraid to reach out and potentially help bring their technology into uh, advancing God's kingdom and to probably a vertical that's not high on their priority list. And so it's a great opportunity. So, Nick, you had something. Uh, so, so a great opportunity to try and, again, not go through all the cost and expense and time to build everything from the ground up. Uh, let's be creative. I should have included you in that as well. Thanks. Uh, yes. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, I would second all of that. I, yeah, if you want to try and compete with NVIDIA building GPUs, then good luck. But, um, you, know, you know, or Intel and everybody else. So I, I think we have 
historically in the church sometimes had an attitude when it comes to big tech that like that's coming from over there so we're not going to go near it because somehow maybe it's intrinsically evil and I think we know full well that there are amazing Christian people working inside of many of these big tech companies as well and we have the opportunity to influence there um, which I think is important and so partnering outside of it as well is um, you know trying to bring the advances that you know has happened in other parts of industry and, and bringing those in I think that there's a lot of willingness as well from those big tech companies to partner with um, with Christian you know, kind of organizations whether that's in ministry context or churches so um, don't be afraid to use them but also please don't spend all of your time money and effort trying to replicate cloud hosting you're not going to do it better than the big guys are um, and you know we may have issues with maybe the leadership sometimes of of some of these companies but we also um, you know, kind of have a responsibility to be good stewards of our own resources and I don't think it's always a great idea to be <laughs> spending those resources trying to replicate something that already exists that's doing it very well. Yeah, I think there's a sort of an interesting analog from the history of AI, which is that I think there's a temptation to, when you're in an organization, to think that your use case is special and to pursue like a specialized solution for your use case rather than because that's like the first thing that comes to mind. I think it's like a deeply human thing, like I'm special, versus pursuing like a general, a general approach that works. And actually, this is what's happened in AI, which is 15 years ago in NLP, we had idiosyncratic models and methods for tagging systems, and parsing systems, and translation systems, and entity recognition systems. And then we had idiosyncratic models for vision, and then we had idiosyncratic models for speech. And thanks to the pursuit of general methods, like the idea of vectorizing everything, um, uh, using common architectures, uh, using a common training method, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Now, the reason that progress is so fast right now is because everybody's using the same methods and they're finding tools that apply across lots of different use cases. And that's why machine learning is moving so fast right now. And I think you could also apply that to human organizations too, which is rather than always thinking that your use case is special, pursue, in some cases, general purpose methods. Um, and then if you're trying to optimize to move fast and reach the most people, then that's, that's like the way to do it. There are obviously cases where, you know, if you're building highly specialized tools for, I don't know, brain surgery or something like that, you would like really want to specialize on that use case. But most business use cases are not that. Um, that's a very good question about profit, non-profit. So I have been running non-profit for many years. And usually the money is coming from business people who are making profits. So <laughs> we have to love them. Okay? <laughs> and that's my first... Uh, since yesterday, I, I, s I went from non-profit to profit. N I didn't change my organization like OpenAI did. <laughs> But uh, yesterday was registered the, the Hello Bible company in France, so I, I raised a few millions for that. Uh, so I'm now on the other side of the, and I really love it, by the way, because <laughs> I prefer to give than to receive. So I think for the business people in the room or the people watching online, and we, we greet the guys online, my wife, I greet my wife. Uh, uh, I think the, the goal, the goal also for us is kingdom impact, okay? The money is not the goal. The, the profit is not the goal. When we believe in Jesus, when we want to help building the kingdom, as we say. So at the end, if we make money, we want to give it. I want to give it. We, with my wife, we already decided. But it's not just about money, it's about technology. So Leo uh, McLaren, who, who talked yesterday about Bible AI, for example, is doing a business, is raising funds to create technology. Uh, Scott Beck is doing a business, is building technology. And if this technology does, as business people we are building, we can make it part of what we give to the nonprofit world, that would be awesome. So the nonprofit organization don't have to spend all this money to build something that we need as business. So that would be my, my answer to your good question. Uh, just to, uh, 
to build, I know we're at time, but just to build off that point with Ferrick, because I think this is important for us, is that we, for a long time in the church, as individuals, have not been willing to put our hands in our pockets to help our own spiritual formation. And what I mean by that is that the amount of ideas that you'll see come out of this room over the next couple of years will be built on the hope that someone's just going to give them money to make sure it happens, rather than actually developing sustainable commercial business models where individual Christians across the country and around the world go, that's valuable and I'm going to support it by paying for it. And I think that is a fundamental shift in the ecosystem that we need to see happen and that you guys should help make happen. Because, you know, the average American household has, even in the lowest economic bands, multiple streaming services paying hundreds of dollars a month, right, for content that does nothing to build up their belief and relationship with Jesus. But if I turned around and told you, and Terry, we've talked about it, like, if Terry turns around and makes you pay $29.99 a month for you version tomorrow, how many of you are going to put your hand in your pocket and pay a subscription fee? And unfortunately, I think many of you will say, of course I will. And then Apple will say your card has bounced. <laughs> and that's a problem. That's a real problem because we're not willing to place the value on the work being done by people in this room and say that it's worthwhile paying for out of the abundance that we've already been given. And I think that that's a, that's a shift that we need to see in the ecosystem. So I think you know, whether it's relying upon commercial models that are coming outside, but also developing our own sustainable business practices within the church and not saying that it's evil to do that, I think is a, is a radical shift that we need to see happen. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for, for all your perspectives. Um, uh, I'm glad, glad, we, uh, glad we were able to, to have a variety of viewpoints from a variety of perspectives over today and over yesterday. Um, so yes, yesterday, some of, uh, uh, some of you were here, some of you weren't. Um, uh, I kind of ch gave a, a bit of a challenge for the panelists at the end um, with a one last question. So I'll do the same today. And we're over time, but everyone else went over time, so I feel like I can go over time. Um, I was on time. Yeah, you were on <laughs> time. Um, so I was under time. Yeah, Spence was under time. We got good representation far here far today. Far. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so this is a in one sen sentence question. So the, this morning, um, we had a great start from, from Dal Anderson talking about risk taking and having faith and being faithful in risk taking. Um, I'm wondering from each of your perspectives, if in one sentence quickly, um, if you could encourage anyone in this room in terms of uh, stepping out in, in faith and trying new technologies or um, uh, responsibly and not in a blind way, but in a faithful way, taking risks um, in your own ventures, in your own organizations. Is there one, in one sentence, something that has been helpful for you when you've thought about risk and entering into risk um, that might benefit those in the audience? Whoever can start. I could start. Oh. One sentence. One sentence. Uh, where's uh, and and uh, Joel and and Ulf are using Greek Room right now to make sure that it's one sentence and do the quality checking. Yeah. Experimentation is your friend. Got to use less words than that. What I use. Good one. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I, it was super inspiring to hear about faith and taking a risk. Um, for me, it's special, you know, because I have been in the nonprofit world for many years. And I, I started three companies in the last uh, three weeks. So, uh, uh, so I have the feeling of w walking on the water. So it's kind of new world. So. Uh, I'm taking risk because I believe that AI has a big potential to help people to connect with Jesus and to grow in their faith. I really believe it's a game changer technology that which we should take risk to use it for good and for God's kingdom. I'll take a stab. The best destinations in life seldom have a straight line and if we listen to the Holy Spirit and our Heavenly Father what may seem like a wrong left or right turn can often lead to a very spirally but beautiful journey 
to great things. What would you do if you weren't afraid? I would finish with, at the start of Joshua, it says, and Moses was dead. That's my favorite line in the Old Testament. <laughs> and it's my favorite line in the Old Testament because he took on the most courageous of missions for 40 years, wandering in the desert, and he was utterly disposable because God can use any one of us to do what he called him to do. And so what my one sentence is, be bold and very courageous. That's, that's the call. Thank you all. And let's give a hand for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Another great day. Uh, James uh, slipped me like a uh, hundred bucks cash early on in the day so that he would ensure that he had the last word of any speaker today. Um, so I fulfilled that and, and now I'll pay for my dinner. Um, okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, so some standouts from today for me. Obviously, I'm going to be thinking a, a lot about chocolate milk um, in, in the following uh, uh, the, f the following days of my life. Um, but it was, it was cool to see, I, I think, I mentioned this in the panel, but a variety of perspectives from people that have, um, you know, been in industry, been at Google, been working in the nonprofit space, been in missions orgs. Um, we heard from uh, Joshua talking about the missional um, AI collective, which was just uh, so great. I remember being in Chicago with, um, uh, James from, from Faith Tech, and uh, we were in the Chicago um, Public Library in some, some portion of that. I remember having this discussion about this like missional AI collective thing, and you know those conversations, like you have one, and you sort of don't think about it again for a while, but then that other person turns out like they just did the thing and, uh, and, and you know, through prayer and uh, lots of consideration, you know, a few years later, now I see Missional AI Collective, and um, it's so cool to see that because it's so needed, and I would encourage you all to engage in that Missional AI Collective. Um, it's something that we, we all need. Um, so we're going to have some optional networking time again now. Um, so it's the official end of the content today, um, but we do have tomorrow again, starting again at 8.45. Uh, so take some time. Uh, make the connections to the speakers today. Sorry I can't get to all of your questions in the panel, so make sure and connect individually to those speakers. And um, let's give another round of applause for, for our interpreters, for our organizers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Oh. All right, uh, if I could get everybody's attention for just a second, um, if, if, if those that are interested, we're gonna have a quick optional design sprint in here.